CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Uh, good evening. It is 6.33 p.m. on Thursday, October 10th. This is the first regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee in the month of October. Next Monday is Indigenous Peoples Day, and by policy, uh, we do the land acknowledgement to start our meeting. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who shall inhabit historic Massachusetts territories to today. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Because all members are not present, we have members participating remotely, all votes are required to be taken by roll call. Let me just make sure that uh, my remote members can hear us and we can hear them. Ms. Exton. Hi, good evening. Good evening. I think we lost uh, our other two members. Oh, uh, there's Ms. Morgan. Mr. Thielman just walked down the hall. Hmm? Yeah. Mr. Thielman's right here. Uh, Mr. Thielman is arriving in person. You must have driven fast. Mm. Sorry that cars are like this. No, 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 no. We all have uh, obligations other than the committee. We're just a happy little part-time group of decision makers. Ms. Morgan, can you hear us? I can, thank you. And we can hear you, so good. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others. All participants are asked to activate your camera and provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Finally, both Zoom participants and people watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. We now go to the public comment period, recognizing that public comment is limited to three minutes per person. It is a 20-minute public comment period, um, which can be extended at the discretion of the chair if need be. And I see from the fact that we have five members, we shouldn't need to encounter that. The three-minute limit will be strictly enforced because we want to have fairness and consistency across all meetings and all people, regardless of their uh, content. We will begin with Patricia Vasilev Misiro. Yeah, actually, myself can go first. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to call. I'm going to call people out of order. So, um, if he'd like to go first, I'll let you do that. Uh, can I speak over here? Dimitri Vasilev. Uh, we are broadcasting out to the real world on Zoom and the internet. So the seat there is essential. Please sit down. Uh, I will uh, identify yourself with your name and your street address. Uh, my name is Dmitry Vasilyev. I live on 18 Cleveland Street in Arlington. Um, we shared with you, and I also would like, if you'd like to have a handout of a presentation that we prepared, um, I can share it with you so you know what I'm talking about. You can give them to uh, our administrative okay. secretary. There's, that's okay. There are seven members and five in person, so that shouldn't be an issue. Continue. The um, clock is running. I will, uh, so we moved to, to Arlington uh, one and a half years ago, and before we were in Somerville, a neighboring city. 
And uh, this is, uh, so we have three kids. Um, uh, so our uh, our daughter Evelina, the oldest, she uh, she went straight to Gibbs. Uh, I will I will be mostly concerned with my younger two boys, and they uh, uh, they went to Hardy School, uh, and so and this is mostly story about my middle uh, my middle um, uh, child, which is Jacob. Uh, so when. When we came here, uh, and after attending for about a month uh, Hardy School, both my boys complained that the level of academics is so behind. It's just, they said, we are basically relearning which we, which we studied in the same class a year ago in Somerville. Just the level of academics, the, in pretty much across the board, is behind. Uh, especially was in math. Bath was, according to them, was kindergarten level. It was very, very weak. And it was pretty demoralizing for them. And it's, it was just basically they said that we're not do learning anything here. It doesn't serve us. And um, so that was experience of, of both of them. Uh, and especially Jacob, who was in the fifth grade, he was coming home with tears in his eyes every day, begging us to do something about the math that was just, was, he found so demoralizing. He loves math, and he was asking me a lot about math. He's a curious kid. And just he, every day he would come over. The math is so boring. I'm s like, it's just an endless hour. I cannot stand it. Daddy, do something about this. And it was lasted for a year. And it was a big hope for us that there was a test to skip math six. And I was telling them, like, well, hopefully, maybe you will get something a little bit more to your level. Because I, I know his level. Just uh, so I, I, um, I, I know math. So, and, uh, uh, and so there was a hope for him. And finally, there was this test administered, and, and we got a message from, from a math department that he didn't pass. How, how is that? It was very devastating, to the extent that I just I couldn't tell him, because he would be heartbroken. Thank you. Your time has expired. Uh, would you grant me? We ha no, we do three minutes, and we strictly enforce it. OK. OK. So uh, we, 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 we will certainly look to have further engagement, but it, in this forum, it's limited to three minutes okay. by, by policy. Okay. Thank you. Patricia Masuro. Uh, hello. hello. I'm Jacob's mom, uh, and I'll pick up where my husband left off. We got the test after mm -hmm. many requests. It uh, turns out our son got all the correct answers, so it was very unusual. Um, I'm actually, I went to college. Uh, let, let me just tell my story. I've, I understand how my son felt because when I was 15 and a half, I moved to the U.S. from Poland. I came to my first math class in ninth grade in high school. I came home in tears. I was devastated. Oh. I want to go home. Please, please, mom. It was about two and a half years behind what I was learning in a public school in Poland in a mid-sized city. Mm -hmm. I knew all this year how my son felt coming home in tears. But in my case, there was administration who, even though I spoke no English, they took me under their wing and they said, you know, you know math. Let, let, me, let me put you in a class that will challenge you. And that changed my life. I worked for four years at Dunkin' Donuts and, and Burger King throughout high school, but I was able to go to a good university because I was good in math. So seeing my son the way he was and, and then finding out he got all the right answers. I was in teaching too. In math, if you get the right answer, you get the full credit. If you don't get the right answer, you get partial credit. But that's not how this test worked. And we, can, we have some examples here. And it was really biased. And the whole a number of, this is not just about my son. This is about all the kids that are listed on here. All these kids and their parents, they've been talking to parents. Some of them are here. Many of them are not. They are afraid. They, they are worried what will happen to their kids. But it's tough to observe it. So you know, I know what it means to be. Different kids are different, and you know, we, are, we as families, we are united in this. This is very important. This is now the health of our kids, mm -hmm. and I was propped up, and it changed my life. I was able to go from the poor neighborhood in Rhode Island, like 
barbed wires around, I don't know, car dealerships to be able to be in a middle class somewhere because I got the education and the strength that I have, which is science and math. And I know science and math, and so does my husband. Mm -hmm. And we cultivate it. And those families do too. They really care. So I, I want to say that there's long-term consequences. We have an example in this sheet where I don't have time to go through. But, but to bar children at this age from this, and it's a single individual's decision. It's a math director. It's not, it's not looking across the child's like, I excel or I don't know, MCAS, all these scores. It's really one person and she hasn't implemented it. I know what, the, what an objective test looks like. She's empowered to make a decision, but she's not the person to be making these decisions, which really move forward for our kids. Like, I'm not speaking for myself. I'm talking about all these kids that are listed here. And I, like, there's so many more. There's so many more. There's Clara, Dimitri, Ryan, Ilana, Jackson, Benji. There's Miles. There's so many kids here. And those kids are suffering. Like, they are, they are suffering throughout the grades. They are not challenged. My son, Jack, who's younger, he comes home, he's different. Like, I just want to say this is so important. It's so important to us as parents. And I can't afford to send three kids into private school because that's what rich people do. And we're just middle class. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Jacob Masuro. Jacob, do you want to speak? No. Yeah, maybe. Do you want to do it? Uh, yeah, you talked about how you feel. Yes. <coughs> you have to. Sit at the his parent can sit with him too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so basically, math class for me is like boring. Mm -hmm. it, like you, you go in, you sit at a desk, and the teacher like says what you do. <clears throat> and basically, like right now, we're learning how to find the area of a triangle. Mm -hmm. And we like just learned the formula. That's something like I would like already know in fourth grade. <clears throat> and this is sixth grade. Mm -hmm. This is like two years behind, maybe even three. I can't really recall three years back. Like, so, so far, it's like a literal review. It's like saying like, like they like don't exactly know, but like, so far, like this is a review. If like I keep, they keep this up, this will be a massive review for 180 days and I won't get challenged. Now, the school like really likes growth mindset. Like you can see it in all the classes. And growth mindset is like extending your knowledge. So far, I'm in a box. A box. That is not high. And I'm already out of it. But they are keeping me in this box. They're sitting on it. They're sitting on, a, on this box that I'm in. I'm trying to push out, but they're like, they're like, nope, you stay in there. Like, and like, let's go to like the real math. Like, it's just boring. Like, I am not challenged at all. Like, I'm just like, oh, I know this, gonna solve it. Already done with my homework that I should be doing, like completed on Friday and it's Monday. Like, and they're like, oh, if you wanna be challenged, sure, take IXL. IXL is just annoying. It's like, it's just like something you would just take and like just answer questions and like, yes, but like it's just annoying. Even my eighth grade year old sister hates it, but that's a different subject. Now like, like, uh, like, like, like I am a plant like, say I'm a plant, and I'm in a farm. The farm's the school. Like, in science, I guess I'm, like, in other, like, subjects, not just science, but, like, ELA, I'm being watered well. But in math, when it comes to math, it's like having one drop every month. In fact, not even a drop. 
one hydrogen molecule and one oxygen molecule every year. Think of that. Like I'm not even learning anything. It's only a review. Sure, that barely helps me, but still, it's like just nothing for me. Jacob, like, thank you for coming before us. We hear you. We hear you. Uh, next, we'll, uh, there's a three limit, minute limit. So thank you. <laughs> Raisa Karasik. Hello. Hello. So my name is Raisa Karasik. I live in Arlington. We live on 50 Trowbridge Street in Arlington. I have a daughter, Ilana. She's in sixth grade now. She went to Gibbs before that. I have the same problem with the test, with the mass education. Mm -hmm. So for Ilana, it started in the third grade where actually on her own, she decided to write up all the math she knew gave it to her teacher and she said, this is all I know. Please give me a challenging problem. And the teacher actually reached to us. From what I understand, the teacher was really impressed by what Ilana knew. But then when she talked privately to us, she said, unfortunately, I have a limitation. I can give her a challenging problem, but it has to be based exclusively on third grade curriculum. I cannot give her a challenging problem. That's going to be beyond that. That's the school rules. And so Ilana never got a challenging math problem. Then in fourth grade, Ilana had to take I already test, which was supposed to determine her mass level. Actually, what she found difficult is unlike other students, she had to take it for four days instead of two. And I presume that was because the program was struggling to figure out her level. And when it did, it actually told us she is two grades above her grade. Again, Elana was really hopeful because she put a lot of hard work. She was tired after that. And she was saying, I did everything I can to show the school I can solve hard math problems. I want to get hard math problems. And we got the same answer that yes, the teacher is aware she is a, uh, ahead of her curriculum, but there is a limitation. She can only do enrichment problems based on what is covered on fourth grade level, and she, Elana actually never got challenging problems. In fifth grade, things got a little bit better. The teacher gave her a few challenging problems, but our main hope was when the teacher talked to us and said that there is this bypass my six option, that Elana is a prime candidate. She definitely knows all the material. She definitely should take the test. She had very high hopes that she will pass it and skip the sixth grade and goes to the seventh grade and actually move forward. And so Lana took the test. And what we heard initially from the, uh, Octavia Brown, who graded the test that Lana didn't pass. And for her, it was very devastating. For her, it was like, I'm trying to, so hard to get challenged in the school, essentially refuses to acknowledge that she has a math talent and challenge her. And what she also noticed that for English, when she was learning English, there were different levels. She, like kids who struggled to read got easy books. Kids who were good at reading got more challenging books. So she kind of expected that for math, if she is good at math, she will be challenged. And so she started to feel like she's failing to show the schools that she's actually good at math. And she started to doubt herself. And then when I talked to Octavia to figure out what went wrong at the test, what I heard is that actually on many problems, Ilana showed the skills that were signature of a higher grade. She was saying like here she is solving a problem at seventh grade level. She, Ilana is using the skills that she would expect a high school student to do. And what Miss Octavia told me, it's not allowed to solve sixth grade math problems using high school level math. It's not allowed. So her conclusion was that Ilana doesn't have the knowledge, understanding, and so she cannot bypass math six. She could be kept there until she develops the knowledge. I was told she just has the skills to get the right answers, but she doesn't have the understanding, therefore she needs to be kept back in sixth grade. Okay, thank you very much. Your time has expired. Federico Freschetti. Okay, so um, thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak. Uh, we are all uh, very concerned. Um, I, beside echoing what uh, the previous people said, especially um, the metaphoric expression of the, this child were really eloquent to me. Um, just a short introduction. So um, I've been involved in a lot of volunteer m activities m in math and bracket school. So APS know me because uh, I've led or co-led the different activities. But the reason for doing this was uh, to stimulate kids uh, uh, to have interest in math and also to, to make them passionate for math and to find what is fun in math. So I've been doing this for four years. Um, 
more um, coming to my daughter. So Clara, she was uh, um, in the charter school in Tucson, Arizona for kindergarten and first grade. We moved here in Arlington at the beginning of second grade. And uh, what she found out is that uh, she almost covered already all the material in all subjects. So what I want to stress, uh, which was not stressed before, is not uh, only problem in math. So I have the impression that uh, the problem is behind uh, one or two years, but uh, in all topics. Uh, as a consequence, she lost the interest in um, several topics, including math, so we're forced to homeschooling. In addition to Braga School, she was also homeschooled by, by myself, essentially, during the full second, third, and fourth uh, year, fourth years, and then in fifth year, so last year, we decided to send her uh, Russian School of Math because uh, we put to work, it was uh, unpractical. So I post, I uh, copied in, in a presentation I sent a screenshot of uh, an assignment which was due on September 23rd, so we're talking about the third or fourth week of school, uh, where kids in sixth grade, so were supposed to have done already six full years of school, this is the seventh year, including kindergarten, so they are taught, they, or the system thinks that they need to be taught how to do 200, uh, 232 minus 56, so uh, subtraction with regrouping, okay, which is uh, something which my son in fourth grade could do mentally in 20 seconds in front of the screen. And so that's a video of three minutes. So kids are spending three minutes in sixth grade and 11 years old doing this. Okay. Uh, then I sent uh, the copies of three pages uh, with uh, the test and the specific comments which I had, I talked to, be, with Tavis specifically about uh, the, these pages. What I want to stress here is that uh, some of the questions are heel posed because uh, a test cannot uh, ask a kid of 11 years old if uh, they prefer one process, one method uh, to count or another, you, you can see the detail there, because preference is not a mathematical concept, so uh, uh, I am wondering, I'm, it is really mysterious to me how a grader can uh, decide what is uh, correct or what is not correct uh, based on this question. A second example is, uh, um, uh, the, there, was, there were a few questions about probability, notions of probability, which I was told by Otaga are taught in sixth grade. So in sixth grade, uh, they are taught these notions, and then kids in fifth grade are supposed to know already these notions. If they don't, they are penalized for this. I, all right, okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, the last uh, in 10 seconds, what I wanted to say is that uh, here in Arlington, it seems that uh, kids who, do, who did their di due diligences at school uh, do homework as, uh, as a consequence that they master the material. Uh, but parents have to pay for extra uh, curricular math. Kids who didn't do their due diligence are accompanied by the school who lower to their level. And, and as a consequence, kids who did their diligences are left uh, unserved uh, alone. Thank you. Thank you. Just to clarify for anyone who's watching either in the audience or on Zoom, uh, public comment is a very restrictive environment. It's really an entry point to bring an issue before us. Uh, we don't engage in conversation. The open meeting law prohibits us from getting into a conversation about something that's not on the agenda. Uh, what will generally happen is when something is brought to us, you'll either hear from the committee through, in this case, it would probably be the subcommittee for curriculum instruction assessment accountability, or from members of the uh, Arlington Public School staff. Uh, but I want to thank you for coming forward and bringing this to us, and you're always welcome to come back. Next item on the agenda is um, noting that the AHS student representatives have been selected. Uh, will be oriented and we'll start at the next meeting. Uh, diversity and hiring report, Mr. Spiegel. Do you want me to drive? Yeah, somewhat. I mean, mm -hmm. Okay, yep, I'll follow that. Give me one sec. Sorry, I'm looking for it. Because you had shared it with me in drive, right? Yeah, you want me to share it again? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't have this one up. I was Sorry, thinking I about outcomes. I know. It's Sorry. 
Well, thank you. Good evening, uh, school committee, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chair. Um, I am pleased to be here again to present the annual staffing update for the committee. Um, I want to thank, before I get started, um, Kelly Piggott, who's a, the assistant director of HR, who really put together many of these slides, and uh, Matt Coleman, director of data and accountability and research for his consultation with the data. So we want to start with the vision and mission of APS, which is what grounds the work we do. We want to ensure that all learners, including all adults in the schools, feel a sense of belonging and experience growth and joy in the work they do every day for students. We also strive to value the, the identities of all educators and students. Sorry. Okay, that's all right. So just go quickly what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to ground this again in the strategic plan, look at some of the staff demographic data, talk about the new hires that we've, uh, the new hires this year, talk a little bit about the reasons people have left the district, go over some of the vacancies we have now, and talk about some of the initiatives that we have been doing and will continue to do. So strategic priority two is valuing all staff. The Arlington Public Schools will recruit and retain an excellent and diverse workforce by creating a collaborative and supportive culture for all staff, providing high quality and relevant professional development, expanding leadership opportunities and shared decision making, and prioritizing representation, diverse perspectives, and expertise. So I'm going to take a look at some of the staff demographics. So if we look at all employees, um, you can see the, the count of the racial and ethnic identification of our, our staff overall. Um, you can see we're just under 6% uh, staff who identify as Asian, uh, just over 4% black or African American, just over 2% Hispanic, and about just under 81% under white. One thing you might note in this slide is that the number of staff who are not self-identified has declined. There are a couple reasons for that. One is we really have been diving into the data, and I want to thank Kelly again for working on this to make sure it accurate, accurately represents how our staff identify. We've been trying to make sure that our data sources match up. And in our onboarding forms now, all staff must affirmatively answer whether they identify or not. They do have the option to not, to choose that they don't want to identify, but it is a, uh, they have to answer that affirmatively, and they can't just leave the form blank. For the new hires, you can see that the representation of staff from diverse backgrounds has increased overall. And this is new hires since last October. Um, we've increased the representation of staff who identify as Asian and black and Hispanic. Um, and again, the, the not self-identified number is relatively low. Looking specifically at Unit A, and as a reminder, Unit A includes all classroom teachers, special education teachers, specialist teachers like art, music, phys ed, uh, librarians, uh, school nurses, related service providers, and other, uh, other categories. Um, in some areas, we have slowly increased representation, uh, specifically among Asi staff who identify as Asian. Um, I, I will note that the black and African-American representation in this group has stayed relatively flat with some fluctuation. And I think there is a, there's a slight increase in the staff who identify as white. And I think part of that is because of the data cleanup where there's less uh, or fewer staff who are not identified. So look, compare where we are with students' demographics versus staff demographics. So. If we look, this chart shows students compared to AEA Unit A, AEA Unit D, which is our paraprofessional unit, and AAA, which is our uh, assistant principals, deans, uh, curriculum directors, special ed coordinators, and, and some other categories of employees. And in this, um, when you look at the, the, 
the comparison, in most demographic categories, the staff representation is not aligned with student representation. That is not new. That's something we've been talking about for years, and the goal is to increase that representation to more uh, match uh, the student representation. We have, um, in some areas, in some, for some units, especially Unit D, I would say, we have, we're a little bit more, um, do have more representation from um, diverse backgrounds. And the goal has been and continues to be increasing that representation, particularly for the groups that are student facing. The next slides show some comparison, um, just a different look at some of the data. This is in the Hispanic Latino identification, comparing AA unit A, A unit D, and students. And the blue line is students. Um, the orange is uh, AA unit A, and the yellow is <coughs> unit D. Um, and you can see there's some fluctuation in um, unit D numbers across the years. The next is the black or African American representation among those groups. And you can see where this, these lines are a little uh, different. The AA unit D has a larger um, representation of people who identify as black or African American. And again, the unit A has been relatively flat. Uh, the next slide shows the same for black and African American <coughs> compared students and administrators, both AAA and central office administrators. And you can see those numbers again uh, with the blue line for students and um, the yellow for central office and the orange-ish, reddish for AAA. The next is Hispanic Latino and then so th those are some of the demographic numbers, and we are continually looking at that, trying to analyze <coughs> the data, and that's where um, looking at the, having Mr. Coleman's been helpful in helping us um, analyze that data and look at it, um, all the data we have in the district. I want to talk a little bit about staff onboarding and retention. So let's talk about some of the new hires we have. We have 61 new educators starting their positions in Unit A since August 28th. Um, that's not 61 FTE, it's closer to 59 FTE. There's mostly full-time hires, but there's a few part-time in there. Um, we have one person who specifically replaced an educator who retired. There were more educators who retired, but um, they were replaced by people who uh, moved positions. So that's a couple lines down. Mm -hmm. um, we had you know, 35 replace educators who resigned, 12 replace those educators who moved to other positions because there is some movement every year. Um, we have educators on leaves of absence this year and we have full year hires who are replacing those educators. Um, we have some new positions in the budget or added this year. And again, as, as we've had for years, the path, we do have a path to becoming a teacher through our paraprofessional ranks. We do have 12 of our hires this year had been teaching assistants or student teachers or substitutes in the district, and that is something that we um, want to continue to do. And as you see, the demographics of our Unit D um, will hopefully in the future result in more um, diverse representations in our uh, Unit A educators. Um, 42 of our hires have a master's degree, at least a master's degree, so we do have a very well-educated workforce here. And we did hire people last year between October and May, so we had about 10 people who started for different reasons in that time frame last year. Uh, for some of the other categories, administrators, Unit D, Unit C, and others, you already met the new administrators at one of the, at the in September at a school committee meeting. Um, we have 50 and counting high, uh, new teaching assistants, specialized support, paraprofessionals, building substitutes, tutors, and that hiring is continuing. I've been talking to people today and have calls to make tomorrow. So we are continuing to hire those. You will see later that we have some vacancies, but we are slowly um, you know, reducing those vacancies. We have some new administrative assistants in the district at the Monotomy Preschool, the Hardy Elementary School, and Central Office. We also did have a, an administrative assistant hire mid-year last year at the Bracket elementary school. Um, 
and um, we also have new staff in the business office. Our communications and family, <laughs> excuse me, communications and family engagement department, food services, after school, daycare, traffic, and others. Um, you know, we've really tried to be more intentional in welcoming new staff uh, to the district. We worked on this a lot last year in conjunction with the leadership de and development and onboarding program designer, which was a grant funded one year position last year. We've been working to improve our, all our mentoring programs, um, including ensuring that administrators have mentors. Um, we're trying to, uh, we've been establishing more clear hiring protocols and trying to improve the, communi the communication functions on the website to make sure that both staff and applicants can get information Recording that they're looking for. Um, I, I, our HR department works in conjunction with a lot of different departments in the district, but I want to specifically highlight the work we do with the DEIBJ uh, department to support staff and address conflicts. Dr. Creedle Thomas and I work closely together on that. Um, so. That is something that is, will continue. You can go to the. So I do continue to do exit interviews as when people want to. It's not. It hasn't been um, a requirement. It's it, but many choose to do exit interviews. What I'm listing here is the most common primary reasons for pe why people leave. Um, they may not be the only reason. So, for example, someone might be leaving to make a, a, a professional move within education. They may also see increased com compensation even if they're going to a lateral uh, kind of position. We did have people making moves within education who moved from um, to other to administrator positions in other districts as well. Um, but we also have that, and sometimes they are seeing an increase in compensation as well as making a a career change that they were looking for. People move away from the area, that's, that, that happens. Um, and you can see the other reasons. One of the things that seems to be a little bit higher this year is the people leaving the, career, the field of education altogether. Um, and I think that's an issue for Arlington. I think that's probably a larger national issue as well, that um, retaining educators in education um, is something that as an educator workforce in Massachusetts and maybe nationally we need to, to look at. Um, one of the things we wanted to look at and with Mr. Coleman, we looked at some of the, a couple of different slides from the panorama data from the spring um, survey. The first slide is from the grades three to five survey and the question was, uh, what we're looking at here is how strong the social connection is between teachers and students within and beyond the classroom. And you can see there's a slight increase year to year in um, you know, how highly valued, those, how, how strong that connection is, how, how students view that. The next slide is for grade six to 12. Um, it's a little flatter in, in, that, um, in, in that age range. Um, and we are working with Mr. Coleman to more fully analyze this data and get and compare the responses across the years. Talk a bit, a little bit about the current vacancies. We have a, a recent a new vacancy as a Spanish teacher at Audison, um, a special education teacher at the high school. We have paraprofessionals. We have about 18 openings across different schools. I think we're actually. Um, doing better this year, I think, with our paraprofessional um, fill rate. Um, it, has been, it is still sometimes challenging, and this is, uh, um, and we are finalizing some of the some hires this year, so this number will go down. And there also may be some additions uh, this year um, based on um, IEP um, needs that could be added later. Um, we have so, several long-term subpositions that will be that we're looking to fill because of leaves of absence that will be coming up. We have a couple interim assistant principals, one at the AHS due to a leave of absence for the second half of the year, and one at Audison based on a vacancy. And we also have some vacancies in food service and cafeteria recess monitors and some other, and I think in our facilities department there's still some vacancies as well. Um, let's talk about some of the initiatives we're, we're doing. So. 
as you know, last year, as part of the strategic plan, strategic plan we had working groups. The working group I was, I, I led uh, with uh, Andrew Amati um, was on staffing and retention. Um, what we did during that, uh, we did a lot of things during our meetings and then one, our main initiative last year was to do some e empathy interviews with staff, uh, current staff, um, mid-career staff, and some s more senior uh, long-term staff to talk about, you know, what keeps them in Arlington. And we, um, some of the things that they mentioned that they, you know, what really struck us was the connections they have with their colleagues and the students. I think that really keeps a lot of staff here. They really feel a sense of belonging with their, in their schools, with their colleagues, um, and they, you know, mostly prefer to live relatively close to where they work, relatively close to where they live, and they want opportunities for growth. Some, some of the suggestions that came out of our working group were to promote pathways to uh, teaching and other education careers that have existed and will, will build upon for students and for paraprofessionals. Um, we should better advertise the benefits that educators have in Arlington beyond salary. Um, we want to find more ways to create connections and that sense of belonging among staff because we did hear how important it is. And create better onboarding experiences for staff in the schools. We'll be working with the DEIBJ task force this year to promote diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and belonging across APS. And as a district, we've been participating, we will be participating this year in the DESE Teacher Diversification PLC. We have continued to be a member of the Mass Partnership for Diversity in Education. And we started this past summer as uh, with the student, uh, excuse me, the Superintendent's Leadership Conference which was a collaboration with Desi and Williams James College. And there's many other things that we, we will continue to do. And I'm open to questions. Mr. Card. Uh, thank you. So a, more of a suggestion than a question. I don't think anybody in town knows that you've got 18 positions paying $20 an hour available. Um, so put something on Facebook, we'll share it. Um, it just, you know, we had the same thing last year. I think it looks like there were 11 positions at this time, not 18, but um, that's still a lot of positions. We raise the salary specifically to try to address that and I don't think people know about it. So let's get some advertising out there. It's posted on the AEA Facebook page, and I've posted it on Twitter multiple times, and people are sharing it through that. Great. So Thank it you. is out. <laughs> and we're getting people who are saying, I was recruited because I saw it on my friend's Facebook page. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great. Dr. Allison Ampey. I'm just wondering how you're doing better advertising and promoting benefits to <laughs> educators. It's something we need to work on. I think we, um, you know, one of the things that we've probably also through social media is some of the, um, the, uh, the other parts of the contract that besides just the salary that we, we mm -hmm. don't um, always advertise. And I think we need to work on that. And I'm definitely open to suggestions of how to do that better. Um, you know, I think um, it's something to, to work on. Yeah, I, I think the mentorship, the availability of the grants from AEF, since I'm the rep this year, I mean, just it, there's yeah. different things yeah, people yeah. can do beyond just the regular uh, stuff, and I think that's what part of what makes us unique. And it, uh, if I were a new teacher I think knowing about the mentorship and, and just the mm -hmm. way going into it that would be kind of a plus we, we definitely highlight the mentorship program during our orientation mm -hmm. and right, that's but a big part of it yeah it's 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 the it's hiring part yeah, yeah it's like yeah. you know it should be I a draw yeah I think some so, of the anyway postings have that but yeah yeah 
Superintendent. I just want to name a couple of other things that um, I'm sure that we, we have a lot going on, so just escape the radar. But um, we did actually purposely put the new communication specialist. We did a little bit of a seat shuffle in central office, and so the new comms specialist is in the HR office. And so sitting in a spot where it's pretty easy for us to um, collaborate, build a post, mm -hmm. put it on Facebook, particularly around a specific post. So instead of blasting, you know, we have 18 positions kind of all over the place, mm -hmm. um, being really intentional about we have these positions at this school for this program. If you want to be in an environment like this, go there. Uh, and so there has been an effort to do some targeted, um, and we have certainly posted on some of our district socials about open positions. Yes but also tried to be somewhat targeted about that. Our um, Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Belonging and Justice, Margaret, Dr. Creedle Thomas, um, is leading an MCAS, MCAS prep course for educators um, who are interested in getting their license, and it has been exceptionally well received and positive and uh, has drawn a very diverse cross-section of staff who are already in the district who are interested in getting licensed. and so. That's been fantastic. We're funding that through a teacher diversification grant. Um, yeah. And I had one other thought, but I've forgotten what it was. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that when people come on in central office, we're being intentional about is making sure that everybody on their first day has a schedule. They're going to meet with each department. They're going to know. They're going to do some learning on that first day. We haven't had onboarding that's sort of intentionally designed for staff outside of roles that get mentored. So that's something we've also been working on. We've done better with that. I also want to, I've meant to thank, um, you know, one of the, re you mentioned, we, I think um, we have been able to hire uh, people this year and we still have more to go, but I want to thank both the committee, the AEA, other bargaining units in town and the, the public in Arlington for allowing us to increase those, yeah. um, those wages for employees. <clears throat> Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Spiegel. Thank you. Next will be the fall outcomes report, Superintendent. Okay. Typically, this report would come to you from the Deputy Superintendent. Um, unfortunately, she's not feeling well this week. There are a lot of bugs going around, and she managed to run into one of them. So uh, you will be receiving the outcomes report from me this week. Uh, typically, also, if she weren't here, we would have Mr. Coleman, but he's otherwise occupied this evening with family affairs as well. And so um, I will be presenting some of our outcomes from 2024-25. Uh, this has presented us with an opportunity to show off some of the exciting work we've been doing around ensuring that we have accurate um, and easy to navigate and automatically updated data available uh, for our educators to use and hopefully very soon that we can share publicly um, and perhaps even embed on our website or provide some level of public access to on some dashboards that contain information that's aggregated and won't compromise student information. So I'll be using some of the data that we have available in that brand new space tonight and as I go I'll try to explain how to read some of those graphs and interpret the data because it is a slightly different representation from what you've seen in the past. So here's the agenda for this evening. Uh, apologies in advance to the chair. There is almost no way this is going to be 12 minutes long, but as this is one of the more important, I think, presentations of the year, uh, I hope it's okay if I go a little bit over. I'll be talking a little bit first just uh, to give a contextual overview for those watching at home and for the committee about um, the accountability system and what it is that we're looking for when we get our results each fall. I'd like to review, I'm actually gonna review this at the end, um, what some of our student learning goals were for last school year so that we can make sure that we're aligned in our outcomes with those. I'll talk about highlights and areas for continued growth in four domains. Uh, the school committee also received what I'm calling the big deck, a larger presentation that has outcomes in all domains and for all focus, focal groups um, for our academic outcomes for this school year. I'm trying to sort of uh, build around four themes tonight, but I will be talking about all four content areas and all of our focal groups as well. Um, uh, yep. Superintendent, the big deck is in NOVAs? Yes. So that anyone who is interested in the more in-depth uh, deck 
you can go and follow the link in Novus to see that. Yes. Um, so the four areas I'll talk about tonight are continued focus on literacy in ELA, K through 12. We have some initiatives that we've been working on um, in ELA specifically, so I'll zoom in on those. I'll talk about focal groups um, and the ways in which we're closing gaps, some gaps that are not closing yet, uh, and some areas where we're holding relatively steady with regards to outcomes and the student experience, uh, by which I mean what we're learning from students about the areas we're monitoring, such as belonging, high expectations, attendance, and advanced coursework. Um, and then I'll talk about what we're going to do to address some of the areas that we still are actively working on. Before I jump too far into this, though, I want to share something that I shared with our staff on opening day. Um, we have been really thinking deeply about what it means for us to have focal groups in Arlington. We're very intentional about our language, and we have named that we want to pay attention to groups that have been uh, historically marginalized by systems that often tell them stories about who they are that don't jive with some of the values that we hold in the Arlington Public Schools, like a belief in belonging that that's necessary for learning, um, that growth requires us to be challenged and engaged, um, and that if we're going to learn, we need to be able to experience joy in that process. So an author whose work I have followed, and she does a lot of scholarship on change work in institutions, uh, Adrian Marie Brown recently published a book, and I shared this quote with the full staff on opening day, and she says that accountability is one of those tricky things um, that calls on you to be vulnerable and think about what it is that you uh, aren't quite there yet with. It, it makes you consider what it is that you are still working on and growing through. Uh, and so she says, accountability is a tricky thing. When I don't believe someone cares about my life, much less my work, I close myself to their critiques. And she goes on to say that if we understand that we cannot cancel other living beings from the world, then how do we find dignified ways of being in communities that face, address, and evolve beyond harmful patterns? When we talk about accountability, I'll pause here to say, when we talk about accountability, one of the things I'm going to raise tonight is that we have patterns of achievement, we have patterns of growth in our system, um, and some of those are harmful. And by pointing out the experiences of some of our focal groups, we actually run the risk of reinforcing those patterns. And it's really important that we understand that what we're working to do is transform the work of the district, the, the systems and policies and structures so that those patterns do not perpetuate themselves. And so I'm going to try to point out the spaces where we see in the data that we might be shifting patterns. Um, and we might be shifting patterns that are causing harm for certain groups in our system, but really for all, because if there are harmful patterns there, everyone is harmed by them. So if we accept that each of us has some responsibility for holding that change, then how do we hold each other close enough to learn our hardest lessons? How do we make sure that there's enough care and love in the system that we can learn about those things that we still need to do better, both for ourselves and for the collective. And with that, I will jump in. So APS, as I noted, has five focal groups that were identified in the strategic plan. Uh, I will be sharing data disaggregated uh, to identify how we are closing achievement and opportunity gaps for these groups. The groups are students who have IEPs, students who identify as black and or Hispanic, students who identify as LGBTQIA+. Notably, that particular category is harder for us to disaggregate by academically because the state does not disaggregate by that uh, indicator academically. Um, and typically, it's only disaggregated by gender identity, not necessarily at, uh, by all of the LGBTQI and A's. Uh, students who are multilingual learners and students from low-income families. So those five groups are groups that have been historically marginalized by educational systems in general and whose achievement we noted in our data dive for the strategic plan were particularly impacted in Arlington. And so those are the groups we've identified as focal groups, but notably our focus on the experiences and achievement of these groups does not preclude us from paying very close attention to the achievement of all students because the idea is that by improving the experience for some, you improve for all. Uh, 2024 accountability data recap um, is that our, our data for districts and schools are assembled from a lot of different sources of data. All of the things listed here are included in the accountability scores for our schools and for the district as a whole. 
Our accountability reports include detailed data for each of those indicators, targets for those indicators, and points for getting progress towards targets. We get a certain number of points depending on whether or not we made improvements. Um, we don't get any points if we decline relative to targets, and uh, if we meet or exceed targets, obviously we get more points for those, and then you, they do an assessment of things like participation rates, accountability percentiles, um, and then other information is gathered uh, relative to student group performance, graduation rates, uh, assessment participation, chronic absenteeism, and other uh, areas that are important for success in our schools. Our target, our percentage uh, for the school district this school year earned us a designation of meeting or exceeding targets. This is the same as last year. Uh, this is a sliding scale, but it's important to note that the better end of the scale is on the left, not on the right. Um, so we have the highest designation that we can achieve as a district. There's also a designation of schools of recognition um, all the way on the left, but districts do not receive that designation. So Arlington Public Schools was designated as meeting or exceeding this year once again, which we're very proud of. Um, here are the accountability scores for each of our schools, or accountability percentiles and progress towards improvement targets uh, for each of our schools this school year. Um, notably, this year, last year we had seven schools that were sort of in the 80th accountability percentile, so this uh, percentile over here all the way on the right, this one is relative to other schools in the state. Last year we had seven of them in the 80s um, and three in the 90s. This year we have four in the 80s and six in the 90s, and so relative to the rest of the state, and I'll show some other comparisons as we go, uh, we continue to improve, and we continue also to improve in making progress towards improvement targets across our schools. It is notable that we have two schools, Pearson Thompson, that are listed by the state uh, in their designation as requiring assistance or intervention for low participation rates on MCAS, and that happens when you have students in a particular subgroup who uh, do not meet the 95% of students' target percentage of participation. We do have a lot of families in Arlington who opt not to send their students to school on MCAS days. Um, and in one of these cases, uh, because there were fewer than five, actually, students in a particular focal group who did not come to school on MCAS day, that designation was assigned to that school. Doesn't matter how many students it applies to. Um, and unfortunately, one of those schools also met all of the targets for being listed as a school of recognition. Um, but if you are require, if you uh, don't hit the participation rate, you don't receive that designation and you receive the requiring assistance or intervention designation. Um, so it is important to us that families send their students to school on MCAS days because it can have a pretty significant impact on whether or not if we're doing great work we get recognized for it. Um, however, it is still wonderful and notable that both of those schools did well in their outcomes. It says requiring assistance or intervention, uh, but our experience has been that for the participation rate, you don't actually receive assistance or intervention um, from the state. So we didn't get any last year. We had one school designated because of partici <coughs> participation rates last year. We received some recommendations about improving at, uh, rates, um, but that's about it. So. So I'm going to jump into some of our trends for this year and talk about some outcomes. Uh, I'm going to start with focus on literacy and ELA K through 12, and I'm going to start also with grades 3 through 5 ELA overall. As the committee knows and a lot of members of the community know, we have a pilot right now um, that just rolled out a brand new curriculum in all grades. Last year it was in uh, two classroom or two grade levels two schools in each grade level last year as a pilot, um, and this year all of our uh, schools are using EL education. Um, we had in ELA a decline of 2% students meeting and exceeding standards overall. Uh, the state also saw some declines, some more significant declines in ELA. Um, it, notably, our growth versus the state was slightly increased. So I just want to kind of explain some of the graphs that you're going to see because this is what an overview slide is going to look like for each of the grade bands and subject areas. So right here is the percentage of students who are meeting or exceeding standards. These are the metrics that we use in the strategic plan to define our goals. Um, so you'll see not only the percentage of students meeting or exceeding, 
uh, but the uh, difference with the previous year, in this case minus 2%, uh, and the increase versus the state average, so a comparison with the state. These graphs are also showing this is a trend line over time, so you can track um, Arlington's meeting or exceeding line, as well as the states here. Um, whoops, didn't mean to click. Uh, and then I've also provided growth versus the state, and as a reminder, the growth score is uh, comparing students' performance with peers that are similar, um, and so we're looking for about 50 there. 50 is sort of average growth. Uh, if you have growth over 50, then that's slightly higher growth. If you have growth under 50, then that's slightly lower growth. So what you'll notice here is that our growth line is higher than the states and that our growth for 2024 right here is um, a little higher than the states and a little higher than our line was last year for the states. So down here is the average SGP. This is the growth number. Uh, we increased our growth by 4.1 over the previous year. Um, and we're 7.7 .7 points over the state for growth. And then in the middle, I will provide uh, an average scaled score, which will just tell you what the score was. There's a certain score students need to reach in order to achieve meeting or exceeding. And then the second overview slide, and I'll have several of these, have a few different um, types of data on them. First, it'll show the breakdown of students who over the last five years have been uh, exceeding meeting in blue. Uh, or underneath the line in gray and red, partially meeting or not meeting um, the standard in that grade, in that content area for their grade level. Okay, so you can sort of see the relatively um, flat or 2% decline um, in achievement this year in ELA. Uh, but notably, I'm also going to provide some comparisons. So one of the things that our new dashboard allows us to do is compare Arlington's achievement with achievement to selected districts. In this case, I selected the Town Manager 12 districts so that we could do a comparison and understand how our trends are shifting over time. Um, so there's a comparison here from 2019 through 2024, 2024 is on the top, that's this year, um, to selected districts, that's this domain here, and all districts in the state who have a measure for that grade, that set of grade bands, right? So you'll see that the numbers change each year. That might be because there's a school that has grades three, four, and five test, and then the next year there's not. Or there's, you know, schools change or fluctuate over the course of the year in the state, so you might see those numbers change slightly. These should stay the same because it's a comparison with our town manager 12 districts, which are districts that have a similar tax base and funding structure to Arlington. Um, so notably in ELA, grades three to five, while we are seeing that 2% decline, we are also noting that we are consistently improving when it comes to comparison with our Town Manager 12 communities and have really done some significant improvement from 2019 to 2024, I think by virtue of some of the work we've done around early literacy, uh, phonemic awareness, uh, teaching phonics, compared to the rest of the state. So we're up to being ranked around 1820 out of the state uh, districts that have similar grade bands in their schools. Um, compared to 60, being at sort of 63 out of 300 and something uh, five years ago. And then there's also a comparison down here with regards to growth. Um, our growth numbers actually improved this year, so hopefully that rate of growth increases as we continue to roll out the new curriculum and look forward to a year of having everybody on the new curriculum. I want to talk a little bit about focal groups in ELA. Uh, so this is demonstrating multilingual learners, ML, stands for multilingual learners. Um, and one of the things you'll notice is that for some of our focal groups, particularly ones that don't have as many learners in them, um, numbers can fluctuate pretty significantly over time. But I want to draw attention a little bit here to the change for our language learners, and that's the green line here, uh, in growth uh, numbers. It's significant and positive that our growth over time from 2023 to 2024 is improving at a rate faster than the rate of growth over time for our learners who are not English learners. And so what you're looking for when you're trying to close gaps is a rate of growth that accelerates learners who might be in a focal group um, or in a group that historically has had lower levels of growth because you don't, what you don't want to see is achievement that's going down for any group of students, right? So here you see it's relatively stable for non-MLs 
we went down, we sort of had a big bump up after the pandemic in 2021. Everybody performed fairly well. That was also a year where we didn't do the full assessment. Um, and then it kind of levels off here. So you, what you want to see is for all of these achievement lines to be going up. And you also want to see growth to be improving, particularly for focal groups. Here, growth is over 50 or right at 50 for our learners, but it hasn't been always at that level and can historically sort of be lower. And for our non-English learners, it is at a higher level right now. If you accelerate your focal group, then you will ultimately raise achievement to the level of the non-focal group. And that's what we're trying to do is close that achievement gap over time. And so it's a positive sign if we're seeing growth improve for a focal group at a rate a little faster over time than for the not those not in the focal group, but you still have growth over 50 or at 50 for those not in the focal group, then that's going to lead to achievement over time as well. So these are our focal groups for students with IEPs in grades three to five ELA. What you'll notice here is that growth over time is not necessarily accelerating at the same, it's similar, but it's not necessarily accelerating at a faster pace uh, than students who do not have IEPs. And you'll also notice that we had a slight increase in our gap from 2023 to 2024 for our students with IEPs in grades three through five ELA. Um, on a positive note, we are continuing to improve relative to our peers, both across the state um, and to selected districts. This is actually a comparison disaggregated by students with disabilities. So it's disaggregating and comparing Arlington's performance for students with disabilities against both the town manager 12 um, and providing a ranking as well as the entire state. We have more work to do certainly uh, to meet the needs of students with disabilities in three to five ELA. Uh, however, we are also in a situation where the state's gap has also been increasing. Um, and so in comparison to some of our peers, we're seeing continued improvement um, and a little bit of stabilization here between 23 and 24. 24. For grades six through eight overall this, in ELA, we're relatively stable. Um, so is the state. There wasn't any significant change from one from this year to last from last year to this year. For our focal groups in ELA at the middle level, we're seeing some decline. Our hope is that with rollout of the new curriculum and making sure that we're focusing at the middle level on what those changes are, so that we can adjust curriculum at the middle level to meet the higher level of rigor that we're experiencing or students are experiencing at the elementary level that that trend will turn around. And so our schools at the middle level are doing some work to understand what the changes and shifts have, will be this school year so that our sixth grade school is prepared and then seventh and eighth to meet those students where they're at um, and pull that level of challenge up even a little bit higher. Notably, um, compared to all districts here, our, we're improving over time in our rankings and our achievement, uh, even though at the moment, things are looking relatively flat um, and achievement actually declined for students with disabilities from last year to this year in grades six through eight. In grade 10 overall, we saw a slight increase of 2% meeting and exceeding from 2023 to 2024. Um, this is the group that was the first group in the pilot of our heterogeneous grouping initiative, which um, did not structurally level students into two separate classes, but had leveling happen in the context of one class. Uh, and so we're pleased to see that there is an improvement. Um, it's a little less encouraging to see that we had some lower growth this year than we'd had over the last couple of years. But it's also not entirely surprising. We had a very high achievement year last year. Sometimes those can follow one another. Um, but relative to the state this year, we had lower growth in ELA. Um, we need to dig in and sort of understand what's happening there. I'll share a little bit on focal groups for high school ELA as well. So here's the district comparison for grade 10 in ELA. We've studied relatively stable compared to town manager 12, slight improvement this year. We've stayed relatively stable and actually gone down compared to where we were at in 2019 when it comes to ELA. At least stable over the last three years after the pandemic. 
This is our focal group, students with IEPs in grade 10 ELA. So if you compare for our focal groups, one of the things we see that is encouraging is a significant shift in growth from 2023 to 2024 that could be a return to norms from 2019. Here you'll see a very relatively high growth year in 2019. This could be a return to some degree of normalcy for our students with IEPs, um, or it could be a sign of some shift as a result of instructional shifts that have happened at that level. We'll have to wait a little longer to see. Um, and you'll notice here we had some improvement for students who don't have IEPs, but it stayed relatively flat for our students with disabilities in grade 10 ELA. For low income, we know we have some work to do. This is gonna be a focal group that you'll probably hear principals talk about, thinking through how they wanna meet the needs of our students who come from in income insecure households. Uh, we noticed that while our SGP um, is improving or even actually cross the line of students who are not from income insecure households this year, uh, it is still an achievement gap that is getting wider. And this is socially true as well. There are income challenges across the country uh, and those gaps, those income gaps are getting wider and wider and wider across the country. Uh, but unfortunately that's having a significant impact on achievement. So we're doing some work to understand what those families need to make sure that we're meeting those needs um, and providing for more accommodations where necessary so that all of our students can take advantage of the opportunities available to them in the schools. For rigorous expectations in grades six through 12, uh, we had relatively stable responses overall. However, we noted that we got different responses with regards to rigorous expectations when we asked ELA questions specifically at the high school. So these are the students who have been surveyed because they were in the heterogeneous grouping initiative courses. And so while our grade six through 12 overall results for the district uh, showed that we didn't really have a statistically significant shift in how students were experiencing high expectations in their classes, we did note that more of our students said they had uh, experienced more rigorous expectations in their ELA classes at the high school in grades nine and 10. And so that's a positive uh, outcome from the pilot. And it tells us that more students are experiencing being held to a higher standard. Uh, specifically those students who were in those courses and were asked about those courses and their experiences in those courses. Um, particularly encouraging here is how high are this teacher's expectations of you. We had a nine point jump um, from one year to the next in terms of students' responses to that question. Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. Is that the nine point, is that nine, the same students or the same grade? That's grade nine and 10 last spring. Compared to, compared to the students we surveyed the previous year, which would have only been the ninth grade students the previous year. Okay. Does that make sense? So it's, we ask the same set of questions. It's a different sample of kids. So some takeaways and next steps on ELA in elementary to continue the implementation of the EL education curriculum, uh, to continue to support that implementation, to make sure we're setting aside time for the professional development required for that, as well as the planning. It's a huge undertaking. Our teachers are doing a fantastic job and they have jumped in with both feet uh, and, so, and a lot of enthusiasm and it's been a lot of fun to watch. So we're going to continue making sure that we're very uh, steadfastly focused on that has also resulted in a lot more attention to ensuring we're doing inclusive intervention, um, ensuring that our students get grade level content at the elementary level. Uh, we have a lot of confidence that that's gonna continue to impact outcomes. Uh, it's hard and it's new, so of course it's a little bumpy here and there. Um, and so it could take a little bit of time for us to realize some of those shifts. But in a year where the state saw some declines in elementary ELA outcomes uh, across the board, we're pleased that we stayed relatively stable in a year and we actually saw some improved growth in areas in a year where uh, we were doing something new and something dramatically new. Um, and so that's somewhat encouraging. We wanna continue to build on that momentum. At the middle school level, we are establishing opportunities for grades six through eight teachers to learn about the shifts in the curriculum at K to five, uh, to develop shared language around what those shifts are, but also make sure it's developmentally appropriate and adapted for the age level that they're teaching. Um, do that vertical alignment and make sure that we're building on the skills students learned in elementary. Uh, and hopefully we can see some shifting in some of the outcomes at the middle level as a result of what we were seeing happen at the elementary level. 
At high school level, we're going to continue to monitor growth and achievement um, in high school ELA, share lessons learned from the pilot of heterogeneous grouping, and assess opportunities for increasing access to rigorous coursework for our focal groups. As students move into the upper grades, I'll share some um, advanced coursework data in a few moments. Uh, for our focus on focal groups, I want to talk about math and science because I want to make sure that we're doing as much talk about math and science and STEM as we are about ELA. We've been doing a lot of work in ELA, uh, but we don't want to lose our attention to and our focus on STEM as well. So uh, in math and science and focal groups, we have some uh, really bright spots, and we also have a lot of areas where we're sort of holding steady, and that's been the story for the state <coughs> this year as well. Um, so I'm going to start with... Uh, low income, three to five ELA, just to reinforce some of what we're looking for, is this increase in growth. Uh, and this is just a, one of the focal groups I didn't talk about a moment ago. This is low income for ELA. Uh, it's encouraging to see that we're hitting that 50% mark for our focal groups, uh, and that uh, for our, but we're still not at the point where we have higher growth for our focal group than we do for our uh, non-focal group. So what you'd really want to see here is for this, both of these numbers to be over 50, but for them to be flipped and I'll, for you I'll to have. Dr. Allison Athens. Yep. I just want to know what the y, I mean, what the x-axis is for the dot graph in the corner. This one? This one right here? Yes. Yes, those ones. Are you so doing that against just growth? A, it's not a, um, it's just dots. Yeah, it's just a distribution. It's like a Hold on. My guess is that you're running again. Well, I don't want to say something wrong here. Okay. If, if you don't know off the top of your head, that's fine. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'd like to know at some point. Mm -hmm. I'm actually not sure it has a designation. I think it's just, a, it's okay. showing the distributive range. But I will double check. Okay. And tell you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so for grades three through five math overall, uh, here are our overview graphs. We're relatively stable, just about the same number of students, well, actually, exactly the same number of students meeting and exceeding standards this year as last year, Percent, percentage wise, anyway. Um, but you will also note. Uh, an improvement overall in terms of rank compared to town manager 12, as well as compared to the state. When it comes to achievement, we don't see the same trend. When it comes to growth, we've sort of been hopping around a bit. Here's our achievement versus the state, and our growth versus the state slightly higher growth than the state this year than we had last year, comparatively. And overall, relatively stable. For grade five science, we've been steadily improving relative to town manager 12, Stead of steadily to significantly improving compared to all districts in the state with relatively stable achievement for 2024 compared to 2023, and improved achievement compared to 2019 through 2022. For our focal groups, this is low income, grades three to five math. What we see here is that we're starting to approach some growth that mirrors what we see for our control sort of group of students who don't come from income and secure families. Unfortunately, we have such a significant gap there that we really need to have significantly higher growth for our students who are coming from in income and secure households in order to close that gap. So we need to continue to do work in this area. This is for students with IEPs in grade five science. What you'll note here is that we had an increase in the gap for our elementary students in science. So this is worth taking a look at and seeing how we can capitalize on some of the science content that is embedded in the ELA curriculum to improve science understanding, and all, but that is not sufficient. So we also want to make sure we're actually doing science in our classes 
allocating time for that. One of the things that we're finding with the new curriculum rollout is that time is very challenging to figure out how to parse so that we're ensuring students are doing science. But we're going to be looking for opportunities for integration and cross-disciplinary learning so that we can make sure that that is also embedded in the curriculum moving forward. In grade five science for our multilingual learners, we're seeing some return to uh, what were probably relatively stable results previous to the pandemic. This is the 2021 bump that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but if you look at 2019, we're almost at uh, where we were before for our multilingual learners. So we're seeing some significant growth there. If you compare it to selected districts and all districts, you can also see it there. We're seeing some positive improvement for our students from income insecure households in grade five science. And so this is a bright spot and worth us taking a look at and understanding why uh, we see so much improvement here and growth, particularly for this focal group of students, because this is a group that we've struggled to meet their needs in other areas. And so we wanna continue to examine that. A significant jump compared to all districts uh, in fifth grade science for our students who are coming from low income households. Okay, this is middle school math overall, relatively stable. Um, most of our middle school results were stable, were relatively flat. Uh, we didn't see a whole lot of dramatic improvement in one way or another on any of the content areas at the middle level. And that was true for a lot of our focal groups as well. You'd have a slight improvement in growth percentage. Here's a comparison for grade six through eight math overall. One of the things you'll note is that we have not improved in this area. And I think it warrants conversation and discussion about our ability to provide all students with equitable access to rigorous instruction as we heard about earlier this evening and to make sure that regardless of what focal group students are in, that they are able to be challenged um, in their math classes at the middle level. Achievement overall is relatively flat. So this is grade eight science overall. Again, relatively flat compared to last year. So was the state with a slight decline. And this is the comparison. We've stayed in more or less the same position relative to other districts, and achievement is somewhat the same. We do see a slight potential. Uh, this actually looks flat on achievement graphs, um, but we see a growth decline for our students with IEPs in grades six through eight math. Um, I think this is worth taking a look at because if that were to continue over time, this gap could get significantly larger. You'll also notice that compared to other districts, we've stayed in either the same position, we've moved around a bit. For our focal group for multilingual learners in grades six through eight math, um, we had saw a significant decline over the course of the last few years post pandemic, and that has turned back up, which is great. Our SGP has been a little bit all over the map relative to non-multilingual learners uh, in the middle levels. And then this is a race ethnicity. Um, these are in the big deck for all of the different content areas. I think uh, worth noting here um, is that is the significant achievement gap for our students who identify as black or African American. Um, on a positive note, the SGP for that group was increased this year. You can see the line here, it's kind of hidden, uh, but we would need it to be significantly higher in order to begin to close that gap. And so we were looking for this number to increase over the next few years. And so it's worth taking a look at what their enrollment profile is, uh, what classes they're enrolled in, considering that in grade eight, we have three different levels of mathematics. Uh, in grade six and seven, we have two. So for our students with IEPs in science, uh, we're seeing some improvement and some improvement over time as well, as well as a significant improvement compared to all districts. 
So this would be another place to look and see what's going right there. Um, notably in science and social studies, our students are not leveled in any way, and so we're seeing improvement for our multilingual learners, for our students with IEPs, for our students from income insecure households in science, um, and it might be worth taking a look at either the, both the met teaching and instructional methods used there for our focal groups um, and the structures that are in place that might be allowing for more access to rigorous instruction. For our focal groups, uh, this is multilingual learners in grade eight science, so that does not follow the same trend. We saw a decrease in achievement. However, we're also seeing that across the state. We're relatively stable compared to selected districts, compared to the town manager 12, but we've improved significantly compared to all districts when you look at uh, multilingual learners in grade eight science. And so this one's a little perplexing because we see a significant dip, um, but it sounds like Ms. Keyes has an answer for us. So what well, do you think? Well, I just want <laughs> to keep in mind, we had a, a massive influx of new to the United States yeah. students last year. And many of them who are in the first year don't have to take the English test and they can fuddle through the math test. They have to take the science test, which is yep. all English. And it's content English, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily the first words that you learn in the new language. So this doesn't surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> Often context provides a lot of information about a result. Um, and while I think it's not the case that our multilingual learner uh, enrollment shifted significantly, so you wouldn't see that reflected necessarily in the numbers, is that they're different students. Mm -hmm. And so if they're newer to the country, you're gonna see a trend like that. Um, but notably, that was true all over the state, right. which is why, you know, relative to other districts, this, this is a graph, a trend graph you'd probably see for the state as well, and it might be even more dramatic. All right, this is grade 10 math, so we're to the high school. Um, and at grade 10, we're seeing some of the same trends carry forward from uh, a, a somewhat flat uh, trend at elementary, middle, uh, become some increasing gaps or some slightly decreasing achievement at the high school level. So here, um, while the state has remained relatively stable when it comes to growth in mathematics, uh, Arlington Public Schools is seeing a decline. And so this is concerning. This is something that we need to take a look at and make sure that we are maintaining level of rigor and grade level standard um, across the board because uh, both the achievement trend and the growth trend is not the trend we want to see. Mr. Chair, sure. just, uh, Mr. Card, sorry, just a point. So the state is always at 50 except for 2021 when they adjusted it because of COVID. Isn't that right, Mr. Schlickman? So the state is always stable. Yeah, they're the right FGT. around 50. Okay. The, partial percentage sometimes, but yeah. But we are not, so we're declining. Right, right, but you said, and the state is stable. It's always stable. It, it's set, it's designed that way so that the state is always stable. By definition, it's a right. percentile yeah. score, so that the, the state, the whole group, the uh, middle score is always gonna be 50. The SGP is always gonna be 50. The mm -hmm. state can't have a bad SGP year. No, no, because right. uh, we're comparing except to COVID. the distribution. Ex except for COVID. Except for Except, there. except for right. when they adjusted it and played with yeah. it during the COVID year, which gave us wacky results. Thank you. This is a comparison for grade 10 math overall. While our relative to other districts is improved, we're somewhat stable with regards to town manager 12. We've gone down a bit when it comes to growth and that reflects what you see here compared to other districts. In science, we're seeing some positive results in uh, grade nine science. So we had a four point improvement to number of students meeting and succeeding over the previous year. This is our growth curve from 2022, 23, and 24. There are not as many years reflected here because of the switch over to MCAS 2.0 and when that happened in science, it didn't happen until 2022, so they can't compare back uh, any further than 2022. There also aren't growth scores for science, which you probably already noticed because they don't calculate that because of the distance of time between when they test. Um, this is over time, sort of the same curve, but you can see the percentage of students meeting and exceeding over time, and that continues to increase which is a positive trend, and our ranking relative to town manager 12 and all districts in the state has also significantly improved over the last few years. 
So once again, science provides us with an opportunity to take a look at what appears to be working well for students uh, and where we might be able to uh, use what's happening there, uh, which could be very applied and hands-on uh, and perhaps more project-based learning in other areas. These are our students with IEPs in, te in 10th grade math. The trend follows some of the larger trends uh, that we shared earlier. Notably though, um, we have improved relative to our peers in the Town Manager 12 when it comes to meeting the needs of our students with IEPs or having students meet or exceed standards who have IEPs as well as with the state. So what that's telling us is that now, we have a significant gap. It did not get any smaller this year, unfortunately, as we had aimed for it to. Uh, and that's happening in a lot of other places to an extent that our ranking is actually improving relative to those other places. Uh, and so those forces outside of the district can also have an impact within and certainly do not excuse us not hitting what we are hoping our, we, we would. However, um, does point to the challenges that are being faced in special education in particular across the state. This is low income grade 10 math. Like a lot of our low income charts, it's sort of moving about a bit. Mm -hmm. Hovering right around that 50 mark. What we would love to see is for mm -hmm. our students from income insecure households have a higher growth rate. So some takeaways and next steps in STEM and focal group areas in elementary is to expand some of our inclusive intervention techniques that we are using um, into our mathematics classes and our STEM classes as well. Define our approach to elementary MTSS in mathematics, do a little bit more definitional work on that and understanding what deeper learning and applied um, knowledge is going to look like in mathematics at the elementary level. Expand opportunities for STEM and STEAM engagement at elementary, including extracurricular opportunities for students. Uh, and keep working on the integration when it comes to topics that lend themselves towards uh, doing some content work in ELA and then applying that in a lab, for example. Um, the more of that that we can do, the more students are going to integrate that knowledge and be able to extend it and be challenged by it uh, so that we can reach beyond uh, simply grade level standard and make sure all students are feeling challenged. At the middle school level, research uh, schedule and inclusion structures that are going to enable access for all students to being challenged. Uh, and, well balanced, and ensure that they also have well-balanced classroom demographics. This was a condition of the bargaining agreement with AEA um, that we ensure that we don't have students that are primarily in a class with other students, for example, who might need additional accommodations. That doesn't create a space where every student sort of feels like they're there on their own terms and able to learn according to what they need. We need to be able to differentiate within the classroom and make sure that students have access to a, a cross-representation of their peers. Um, explore, we want to explore options that expand academic electives as well for upper middle school and high school, and I'll talk a little more about what that could look like um, in the next section. At the high school level, we'd like to disaggregate course enrollment by focal group in order to understand what some of these trends are um, and how we can shift them because uh, one of the things that we're also seeing in our high school data that I'll talk about in a moment is that there's differential access for focal groups to some of our AP coursework, our upper level coursework, which is telling us that they're getting the message early that they're not in a space where they can be challenged or uh, are encouraged to be. And so we want to take a look at that and try to understand it a little better. We want to talk about ways to expand upon and make more equitable past successes in increasing accessibility to that coursework in science and math and build on some of our emerging strengths in interdisciplinary courses in the sciences, try to understand what's happening there that's working so well for students. Um, the student, so I want to talk a little bit about the student experience, which are some of the other indicators that we also use. Um, our, as I said, our vision statement uh, has as sort of its theory of operating that if students feel engaged and connected to school, if then they will come to school. If they come to school uh, and are engaged in school, then they will achieve. And so we want to take a look at some of those metrics as well. Um, Mr. Spiegel shared actually a couple of the same graphs that I am going to share, so I'll move through these a little quickly. Uh, sense of belonging is is stable, flat, um, compared to previous years. We actually are thinking about shifting some of the questions that we're asking in our surveys because students have seen them multiple times at this point. Um, so it could be that they're not going to shift a whole lot because they've given the same answers 
um, over time. However, we can, there are other categories that we can dig into to better understand sense of belonging. Um, this hasn't moved much over the last several test uh, administrations in grades three through five, uh, but we do have a couple of things that have shifted. So in teacher-student relationships in grades three to five, we're seeing some improvement in students reporting, and these are just a few of the questions that they uh, were asked and that they had some pretty significant jumps up in. Um, students said that they are feeling connected to their sort of their teachers in emotional moments, um, that they're feeling like their teachers are very invested in uh, how they're feeling when they walk into class, that they feel connected to those teachers. Um, interestingly, in several domains across different uh, age levels, we had um, students rank both teachers and other students as slightly, not necessarily statistically significantly slightly, but slightly less respectful towards them. And so um, we're not sure what that's about, but that was one question we ask a lot, and we did see a bit of a dip in people's perceptions of respect. And so that's perhaps something worth thinking about and looking at uh, as we head mm -hmm. into the school year. In rigorous expectations for grades three to five, we're continuing to sort of see a stable result. Um, it is notable that this is not a lot of time along the bottom. Uh, in the academic graphs, it was 2019 to 2024. This is only 21 to 24. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do two administrations of this over the course of the year. So we did not see a difference from spring 23 to 24 for grades three to five, um, but we're hoping that with the new curriculum, students will continue to feel challenged by that in uh, ELA, that we'll work on uh, math and that students will uh, continue to feel like they're held to a high standard in our classes. And for sense of belonging in grades six through 12, as noted before, um, some of these results are relatively stable, but we do have an increase in improvement in rigorous expectations. With being held to a high standard often comes a sense of belonging with time and a, and a sense that you're respected for the, what you bring to the classroom and the growth that you are uh, engaging with. So um, hopefully we begin to see belonging shift as we continue to raise the bar for our students. Uh, AP Trend data is showing us that we have more students taking exams as well as more exams being taken by the students who are taking AP classes. And so we have more students taking more AP classes. And so what we're working towards, is, this is good news, we want students to take courses that are gonna be challenging for them and we have a lot of the same students taking more of those classes. And so what we'd like to do is expand some of the access to that and have more of the, our student population writ large, particularly students in focal groups, having access to those courses um, feeling empowered to take those courses, knowing they can do it, uh, and knowing that we believe in their capacity to do well in those classes. So I just wanna name a few trends here when it comes to advanced coursework at the high school level. Um, first, we start to set students up for success in classes like this at a very, very young age. And so the messages we send through elementary school, uh, through how we engage in intervention, through how we structure their middle school schedule, all the way up until they enter high school have a huge impact on their participation rate and their achievement in advanced coursework completion. And notably, this is uh, talking about advanced course completion per, by subject, but not just APs. So advanced coursework as defined by the state is not just advanced placement classes. It is also other selected classes the state has defined. I put a link in the big deck um, to what that list is, I'm pretty sure, and if I didn't, I can add that to the materials in Novus so that people know which classes these are. Uh, at Arlington High School, it's pretty much AP classes, but there are a few other classes, like computer science classes, that also qualify as advanced courses. Um, we've done really well in mathematics over the course of many years due to some concerted efforts by the math department to increase participation in advanced coursework. We also did, um, so one, notably, we've had some data calibration issues. Uh, in 2021, one of the things we noticed was that there were only two classes that were actually getting like picked up by the state in our data submissions as advanced coursework. We have fixed that. So now our dashboard is showing all of the advanced coursework that students take this year as advanced coursework. But historically, we had not reported that appropriately and set it up in our systems appropriately. So we have corrected for that at this point. So these are the data for this school year. And you can note that the percentage in math and in history and social sciences for our focal groups is high, is closer to what it is for all students in terms of um, completion rate by subject. But it's still not at that same level. So we still have work to do when it comes to access to some of that upper level coursework for our focal groups. Um, in these areas, but in math and social studies, it's higher. 
uh, in science and technology for our Hispanic and Latino population and low income, um, it's a little bit higher and closer to uh, what the all students rate is. And in ELA for our students who identify as Hispanic or Latino, it's also a little higher. Um, but we certainly would love to see more participation in some of these courses. Um, I should have also highlighted African American right here for ELA because it's closer, but again, nowhere close to what it is for all students. So we'd really like to see more participation by focal groups in some of these classes, and it raises the question about what policies, structures might be in place, um, what practices are in place, what unintended messages are being sent to our students um, that they may not fit in those classes or that those aren't classes that uh, they can take. So this is something that we're paying close attention to and would like to continue to work on. Um, I'd also like to speak a little bit to attendance and chronic absenteeism. This has been a mm -hmm. hot topic in the state for the last few years after the pandemic as we saw significant decreases in student attendance. Um, student attendance for the 23-24 end of school year is listed here. You can look across our focal groups and note that the average number of absences and the chronic absenteeism rate um, is significantly higher for those in our focal groups than for all students, uh, and that our chronic absenteeism rate in 23-24 was still relatively high um, at 9.4%. We made improvements in this area, so I'll show some of our uh, highlights here on accountability. Um, we've been making improvements in this area, but we have a ways to go, particularly for a couple of our focal groups. Uh, we declined relative to, I don't know if I have a highlight for that, no I don't. Um, we declined relative to low income and EL and former EL students. We improved below targets for our high need students and students with disabilities at grades three through eight. Um, we exceeded our targets for our black and African American students, uh, Hispanic Latino students, met targets, multi-race uh, exceeded targets, um, but certainly at grades three through eight, we have some additional work to do. Notably, this is also where we see the most absenteeism. Um, at the high school level, there are other incentives for students to be at school, including getting credit towards graduation. Uh, and so we've seen some really marked improvements in absenteeism at the high school level. Oh, there are my lines. Okay. Um, our dashboard also gives us the ability to dig in via, uh, via uh, its a disaggregation capacity to our focal groups when it comes to absenteeism. Um, we do have more or less uh, strong attendance for our students who have IEPs and a little bit more chronic absenteeism. You can see the larger red bar here. Um, and then our chronic absence rate down here. Uh, versus the previous year, it has improved significantly for our students with IEPs. You can see the minus 2.5%. Um, this is an aggregation of all of our data in the system uh, looking at absences, and you can also uh, take out things like excused absences, but the state doesn't care if it's an excused absence. They'll count it as an absence either way. Um, but it does allow us to sort of see what are the reasons for the absences, and so we're going to be using that to dig in a little bit deeper and understand, like, what are the causes of the absences? Uh, are there patterns to them? Do they happen on certain days a week? Do they happen during certain months of the year? And are there things that we can do to intervene um, with more specificity now that we have better data systems to support it. Here are our multilingual learners. We have significantly higher uh, chronic absenteeism rates for our multilingual learners than for those who are not multilingual learners. You can see that here. And this is by race and ethnicity. and by gender. This is one of the few metrics we actually have that show us um, those students who are identifying as non-binary. Uh, notably, we have more students who, are, who have excellent attendance who identify as non-binary than um, who identify as male and female, but we also have more students who are really struggling with attendance in that category. So you sort of see the extremes. Mm -hmm. There are students who feel very connected to school who identify as non-binary and also students who don't feel like they're very connected to school. Um, and we know that that can have a significant impact on mental health and ability to attend at school. So. so our takeaways and next steps for this area are to maintain our focus on rigorous academics and challenge, uh, continue to expand extracurricular options for students because we know that when they have those connections um, to teachers, to uh, school outside of the regular school day, that that can improve sense of belonging, that can improve um, their sense of efficacy when they're at school and doing their academic work. 
We'd like to monitor, continue to monitor sense of belonging, think about different ways that we might be able to measure that with our surveys, ask some different questions, get some new information from students. Um, and we're working on developing, using the dashboard, some data-informed adult cultures while we're rolling out EL, the EL curriculum, getting more opportunities for belonging and engagement into our schools at the elementary level. Uh, in ACE meetings, we're starting to use the dashboard uh, with educators. We're hoping to do a more full rollout very, very soon, as soon as we've worked out a couple of remaining um, kinks and can do some professional development around it. Uh, hopefully on our November 5th day, we're gonna have some time for that, our professional development day. Uh, in advanced coursework, we'd like to examine, as I said, access barriers for our focal groups to advanced coursework and uh, resources that we would be required in order for us to expand that access. We know that that's gonna come with resource needs um, and so may need to be done over a long period of time. We'd like to design opportunities for um, giving students access to specialized topics at the middle level. Uh, think about reducing directed studies so that students can dig in on topics that are really interesting to them. Again, that would require resources, but it's some ideas that we've had to give students the idea that like when you get to high school, you can really pursue this thing that you might be interested in. And so that's something we'd like to look into um, and think about what it, would what it would cost us to resource that in the next year. Uh, for attendance, we want to develop some positive and collaborative and multi-tiered uh, approaches to uh, improving school attendance, especially for focal groups that are struggling with that, integrate some data monitoring into our current practice, some sort of live data monitoring of attendance so that we can identify any, any trends and challenges and make sure we're intervening really early, work on some new strategies. We do have a chronic absenteeism team that's going to be meeting this year and getting feedback from families um, who are challenged by attendance so that we can think about ways to do this in a partnership way. I actually am starting to veer a little bit away from talking about chronic absenteeism all the time because I think it's a very sort of negative way to frame uh, what are attendance challenges. I think we can talk positively about attendance at school and how important it is. And so we're thinking through um, how we reframe and build partnership around this challenge uh, instead of framing it constantly as a, as a struggle. So uh, we'll also be obviously um, implementing the new staff attendance incentive and working on modeling this ourselves. So our next steps for 2024-25, these are the school committee approved goals and that is that we will improve experiential outcomes and academic outcomes, all the ones I talked about tonight, um, as measured by all the measures we talked about tonight of our students in our focal groups through focuses on major instructional priorities, implementation of new curriculum and practices aligned with deeper learning. The things we planned on doing this year for that was implementing a definition of high quality instruction anchored in deeper learning. We did develop that last year. Uh, we will be working on building that into instructional rounds. Um, teachers will be also doing those with their ILTs at their schools and we'll be disseminating that to students, families and staff so that we can build sort of a common understanding of what it looks like to uh, engage students in rigorous and engaging instruction. We'll be providing professional learning to support high-level implementation of the new curriculum um, and deeper learning across the system, conducting con and we'll be conducting planning about the future of leveling practices at the secondary level. We talk, I talked about that a little bit, um, starting with middle school math and ninth grade core content areas. Those discussions are set to begin before too long, and they will be long. Um, they, we will need to do a lot of engagement around this particular topic, but. The data is showing us that it is time for us to really be digging into those action steps. Some immediate next steps include EL expansion at K-5, implementation of our collective bar bargaining <coughs> agreements. Um, I'll talk more about working groups in my superintendent's update, but we do have working groups centered on our strategic initiatives this year, and they have specific tasks assigned to them for implementation of the strategic plan. Um, we will be presenting school improvement plans uh, that will show you some of these data at the school level and highlight areas of challenge and areas where we're making significant progress towards our goals at the school level. And we will be um, expanding our partnerships with families and town departments, including the English Learner Parent Advisory Committee, a group that has gotten off the ground and is stable and has been meeting regularly, and we're very excited about that our Special Education Parent Advisory Council, uh, task, our task forces across town, um, and uh, building engagement opportunities for families based on interest areas, and of course, continuing to consistently review practices and procedures to ensure equity and access for all of our learners, including our adults in the system. And I believe with that, I will take any questions or feedback. Any questions or feedback from the committee? 
start. Mr. Carden. Um, thank you. So um, I, I think you mentioned that you saw uh, ninth grade science as a, as a success, one of your, our successes. Is that did I hear that correctly? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's that's one area where classes are leveled, but we're having a lot of success. So I think I think the data on the whole issue of leveling is a little bit more obscure that you then you may be making it out to be. I mean, certainly with regard to the percentage taking advanced classes, you need to look at that. But as far as the MCAS scores and the narrowing of gaps, we've tried it with ELA. There's been no improvement. We've had a lot of success in science that's leveled. So I think we need to look more carefully at the data as we have those conversations. Um, and then one other point, I appreciate the inclusion of the comparison to the state communities because that does give us a picture of what's going on um, in our overall environment. But our strategic plan is tied to meeting or exceeding. And that's an area where we haven't seen much growth. So we still need to focus on that because that's what we've tied our strategic plan to. And I know, I know you are, um, and I appreciate the other information, but hopefully, you know, as we see the SIPs, they're going to focus on the meeting and exceeding. Thank you. Can I just respond to that Go quickly? Right I believe I said that our middle school science classes are not leveled that because they're not. They're inclusive, and actually that's where a lot of our inclusion happens. As, uh, and I don't mean to imply either that leveling is the only cause of success or not, because it's not. Um, that's one factor. Like how we sort of structurally group students is one factor among many, 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 many factors that impact achievement. And so I don't want to misconstrue or have it conveyed that there's a theory of causation here uh, for any of those areas, because that's not my intention. Um, and I, I don't believe I said that ninth grade was unleveled, but if I did, that was a, I misspoke. No, 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 I'm just, I, I was just making the point that we've had a lot of success specifically with the grade, grade nine science test, mm -hmm. which is on material that's only taught in grade nine, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And that success happened in a, in a leveled environment. Yep. Right. Good. Um, I also, uh, wanted to note that for the comparisons, those are, it's possible that some of the comparisons I grabbed when I was doing the uh, big deck were scaled score comparisons, but we also, like most of them were meets exceeds comparisons. So we were comparing against, because of the strategic plan and the fact that it says meets exceeds, I'm comparing against the meets exceeds percentage rate of the, the selected districts and the state. Yeah. Not just scaled score. Mr. Thielman. Okay, go. I just, I want, uh, so I want to ask a couple of clarifying questions. On the multilingual learners slide, mm -hmm. what, <clears throat> I was going to stop during the middle of that, but I was confused in the, I don't know if you can put that back. What are the numbers? Because I'm, it says which, number which of students, 5,794. That can't be. Which one? Where are I? Attendance, <laughs> multilingual learners. For attendance. Is that the right number of students, not EOL? So <clears throat> what are our multilingual, so two, what, what are the number of multilingual learners that we have? I'm confused by that. So, so it's additive across, here, hold on. I think you're looking at this, Mr. Thielman. Why don't you put it on the screen? Or, yeah. <clears throat> right? Yeah. Right. So. This number yep. is not entirely accurate representation of our full enrollment. Right. Um, but if you add it to this number, yep. it's close. So how many multilingual learners do we have? So this would, to about 200. Okay. And in the eighth grade, we talked about science scores and the impact that multilingual new students might have. How many students are in the eighth grade? Um, put the science test and we're new students whose first language is not English. First year in, this, in the district. What's the N here essentially is what you're asking? Uh-huh. If you give me 
two minutes, I can figure that out for you. All right, well, I'm just curious because we, <clears throat> I mean, I just, you know, statements made that those students might have impacted the scores, and I'm just curious to know how many, yep. Hold on if that's second. statistically, what that, I just want to clarify that number. Well, it doesn't get reported if I it's know not, that. if it's too low. I know. Um, but you're right. The, I mean, those fluctuations are going to be greater right. if it's a smaller number right. of students, and the number of students fluctuates wildly each year. Right. So the, the cohort, and we don't have this in the dashboard right. right now, but the cohort analysis for some of the focal groups might be a better analysis to do. Yeah. We've always done it year over year over year. Because I would, I would be cautious about anyone accepting the premise that new American students whose first language is not English had an impact on the eighth grade scores unless we have hard data to support that. So in this case, we're talking about 12. Okay, so 12, 12 students. students. Okay. All right, thank you. <clears throat> um, then my next question is if we go to um, the 10th grade experience at Arlington High School, our growth scores for mathematics were 51, 52, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then our growth scores for ELA put us at a rank of towards the bottom of the state. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's, <clears throat> that's not insignificant. So I'm just wondering kind of where that is ranked in the priorities of the district to reflect on that and what the process of reflection looks like. So first it looks like me having some lengthy conversations with a combination of Dr. Ford Walker, our new ELA director, ELA teachers, doing some disaggregation of growth across those focal groups and trying to understand what happened with growth. This year's growth for ELA was particularly low, so I want to go back and look at last year's achievement and, and also do some cohort analysis because what it's suggesting for those students is that their growth through last year compared to the previous year wasn't as high as the previous cohort's growth through the previous year. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so is like to the extent that that's a trend could be a cohort effect. This is also a group of students who entered middle school when the pandemic hit. And so one of the other questions that I have, you all asked me um, when I was interviewed, what are the two groups you're most concerned about? And I believe my answer was, I know, I know what my answer was. Um, it was the students who were learning how to read in that moment because you, were, I was actually quarantining when, when that happened, and the students were entering middle school. And so one of the things we don't quite know yet is what, what that's gonna look like over time as you compare a different group in 2023 to 2024. Um, so I'm not, like, it, I'm curious about the growth numbers considering achievement went up two points overall considering we saw some improvement in growth in certain focal groups, but not in all. Um, it, it's a, and, the, and that the state's numbers are also a little um, all over the board with regards to achievement in ELA. So I think a little more comparison, looking at some other districts where they've done work similar to what we've done and what was their achievement, what have their results been, is, would be worth digging into. Um, nothing is worth drawing conclusions about right this minute, and so again, I don't mean to try to—I don't mean to do that. But. Is there is there is it possible to isolate the results by individual teacher to see if there were different strategies employed in different groups that might be working and better than other strategies? We have the ability to do that. Yes, I think um, doing that in the context of discussions with teachers to reflect upon what some of the other contextual knowledge is that they have of the classes is important to do uh, because students end up getting grouped differently depending on what their needs are relative to an IEP or multilingual service, for example. And that can shift class to class. So you don't want to draw, like, like we don't want to draw conclusions from some of this big aggregated data, you don't want to draw conclusions from some of that disaggregated data either. Um, 
I had another thought just now, but I've lost it. So. No, that was a pretty good thought. Um, and then the the I, I, you know the attendance rates for Black and Latino students were twelve and thirteen percent, I think it was. Um, and so, what 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 are the, what are the discussions like in, in in the district in terms of trying to uh, of addressing that? Sorry. Um, Do I have it right? Hold on. Um, well, our in, our attendance for. I mean, students I'm of sorry. color in some areas significantly improved, so I just want to check that. I thought it was maybe absence rate. I'm, I'm confused. But. I think w one of the things we're, we are noticing for absence, particularly in grades three to eight, is that our students from low-income households is where we really need to pay the most attention. Yeah. I think what we know sort of qualitatively, too, is that the demands on those households are so significant that transportation can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. So we're looking into what can we do to alleviate that challenge? If it's a temporary challenge, are there things that we can put in place for a period of time to build a routine? Um, routine can be challenging sometimes. Uh, if you know there's job instability or income instability, uh, where you're at any given week could shift to, like we've experienced this with families. and so. Um, working out systems that will allow us to meet that need exactly where it's at to get the kid to school. Um, one example I have from this year is a, a family recognizing the breakfast program existed and that that helped them get to work on time and also saved them money was a game changer. And so making sure we're advertising things like that, using things like that, suggesting them, working with our after school program to provide scholarships for families when that's gonna be a game changer for getting the kid to school in the first place for the family. Um, those are things, those are strategies we started deploying this year and we wanna to watch to see if that has an impact for that focal group. But that's kind of the area of focus in that area. I, I mean, I know you know this, so it goes without saying, but if they're in school, they're more likely to, <laughs> act, to grow academically. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, <clears throat> so I think it's obvious. It, it has an impact on, on everything mm -hmm. in their performance. All right, thanks very much. Yep. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I f so one question is, okay, so first the question you had about how many um, ML learners there were, uh, one chart shows ML and former ML or EL and former EL, um, yeah. and the other just says ML, but I don't know if it's actually ML and former. If it just says ML, it's just ML. Okay. If it says ML and former, then it's that larger group. Okay. Um, and as they, it, the state reports ML, it can be really helpful to look at both. Sure. Because no, I, of the growth that happens right. as no, they I move I was just confused out. because yeah. there's different numbers and I realized, oh, maybe they're not exactly Yeah, I might same. not have been <laughs> consistent. I might have yeah. grabbed yeah. where so, I didn't mean to, but. Yeah, <clears throat> so like other people, I was also concerned about the grade uh, 10 English and the growth scores, the, the achievement is, is the same for all, but the growth is down. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at at least the students with disabilities, the low income and the high needs, those are all up from the previous year. So that's good. It's just a matter of figuring out how can we get the other, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the regular, everybody else up also. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm glad that you're talking about this for, um, in terms of addressing the uh, needs of the low income, especially, I wonder about summer school and, mm -hmm. or, or summer programs. When I say summer school, I really mean summer programs and just trying to maintain the learning over the year because that's been shown to be one of the major contributors to increase the achievement over time, or at least that's what I understand. So that's something I'd look for. And then finally, uh, in terms of your concern about talking about chronic absenteeism and, and just that it's always a negative thing, what you were saying is exactly where Desi is. Uh, as I saw on the T, um, mm -hmm. most of you can't see, this is a poster that I saw that says Desi at the top, then it reads, your presence is powerful, doe.mass.edu, and it has a, a QR code. And the QR code sends you to a 
uh, website where it wants you to submit a creative piece of artwork, music, photography, video, blah, 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 um, to talk about why it's important that you attend school <laughs> or, or to express why you attend school. So they're also doing mm -hmm. things. Uh, mm -hmm. But I thought it was interesting. They've they've released some resources and model messaging too that districts can use to help with some of that sort of positive proactive messaging. Ms. Keys. Okay, I have two things. One, if you're sick, stay home. If you're not sick, go to school. Because I think we have some people who feel they need to drag themselves in coughing and sneezing and hacking up a lung because they said they weren't going to be chronically absent. If you're sick, stay home. Mm -hmm. If you're not mm -hmm. sick, go to school. Um, I always feel like I need to say that because it's – it's the kids who take it to heart, who hear that message the most, mm -hmm. and then get really upset when they have to stay home ill. So, um, and I just, I'm so glad you included the town manager 12 scores mm -hmm. on there, the comparisons, because while we've made improvement in our salary rankings compared to the town manager 12, our scale average is still nine out of the 13. Mm -hmm. And I loved seeing all of those scores that were twos, threes, fours, ones. Yeah. So we are performing far above what we're paying. And I just want to make sure everyone keeps that in mind. Mm -hmm. Can I respond real quick to Go right ahead. a couple things? Mm -hmm. um, we are, one. I didn't name this as an action, but one of the other things we're looking at is uh, making sure that our summer programming, um, Dr. Ford Walker talked about this a little bit last time, is more accessible and uh, for particularly for our low-income families, particularly our Title I programming, because that meets the need of that particular group of families often. Um, and also making sure that we're providing the same kind of um, subsidy in all of our programming, including uh, programming like ACE, Arlington Community Education. So we have a revised uh, policy that we'll be sharing soon uh, for the fee structures for ACE courses, um, including the summer fund program, which is uh, one that a lot of families take advantage of in the summer and can provide a full day of programming. Um, and so those are a couple of things to the point that you had made that I think uh, I wanted to make sure I named as well. Okay. Any, any other questions or comments under this agenda item? Seeing None, we move on to the preview of the fiscal 2026 budget process proposal. 2026, wow. Uh, Mr. Gorski. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, school committee members and other attendees of the meeting. Yeah, hold on, I'm working on it. So what I'm going to share this evening is the draft proposal of the budget memo that is going to go out to our um, principals and department heads on November 1st, uh, three weeks away. Uh, I'm very excited for my first budget development process with the district. Um, so this is going to, this is very similar to what you've seen in the years past. Um, the FY26 budget build marks the third year of the implementation of the uh, five-year strategic plan. It also includes a budget timeline, uh, which is color-coded. The blue items are internal to the district. The ones that are highlighted in yellow would be um, public, and those include a couple of community meetings, community budget meetings, which um, the superintendent and a couple of the members of school committee are going to discuss the structure of that but we're looking at november and december for those uh, as i mentioned november 1st kick off with the memo uh, do budget documents will become available there is a um, we're, we're planning on november 6 for a budget kickoff meeting with administration um, there'll be a request uh, form deadline right around the holidays and then we are planning on having our um, budget collaborative meetings in the second week of December um, that's kind of shifted a little bit 
And we're also looking to have, uh, as part of these budget collaborative meetings, you typically discuss how the current year is going. You're looking at the request for the upcoming budget year, and you're reviewing uh, rosters and for the schools and departments. We're planning on have, having separate meetings, uh, which would include Mr. Spiegel and myself with um, principals and department heads, looking at their staffing, ensuring that everything, uh, obviously there's a lot of, there's changes throughout the year, there's partial FTEs, ensuring that all of that is accurate. Most of the time it is, there could be some changes, um, whether, the, whether it's the general fund or a grant, look at some of those items, so that that's all sorted out before we go into these budget collaborative meetings. Uh, I think in last year that was primarily driven by the, my predecessor and his deputy. This year that process is gonna include the cabinet team meeting with um, principals and department heads to discuss their requests as part of the larger budget. Notably, we're not going back in time for the requests to school committee regular meeting. That should be a 2024, so we'll fix that when we create the budget calendar. That's why this is a draft and not the, <laughs> right. fi the final project product. Um, and then, again, a, as we tick through, down through this, there's obviously a budget request mm -hmm. to go to a regular school committee meeting, um, school committee voting to accept the town appropriation, um, and then we go down to uh, the superintendent's proposed budget in February, the public hearing, uh, the school committee's approval of the proposed budget, finance committee budget presentation, and then town meeting opening in April. And a version of this uh, budget timeline, which will be cleaned up with dates, more information on the community budget meetings, um, will be posted on our district website. If we come down below um, the calendar itself, there are some other items that will be discussed at these meetings, including the line item budget numbers, the request for budget changes, um, the goals and objectives, and then, uh, as I mentioned, the position control rosters, and then there'll be open hours for uh, principals and department heads to be able to connect uh, with me. Uh, to discuss their budgets, discuss current fiscal year spending, and then what they're thinking about for their priorities for FY26. And the meetings themselves, we're looking at 25-minute meetings. Um, from my experience in Somerville, that might be on the short side, but I will be happy to keep that to 25 minutes if we're able to do that. And possibly with our pre-meetings uh, on the staffing, that will be possible, so. <clears throat> With that, I don't know if the superintendent wants to add anything to. Mm -mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That I open up to any comment or question by school committee. Members of the committee. Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for your first report. Um, Vote and approve school cafeteria MOA. We have before us a, a memorandum of agreement between the Arlington School Committee and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 93, Local 680, AFL-CIO school cafeteria workers, uh, which we need to approve in public session. So the motion would be to approve the memorandum of agreement and authorize the chair to sign this on behalf of the committee. Motion by Dr. Allison Ampey, seconded by Mr. Thielman. Any comment or discussion? Roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Exton is, is dropped off. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Are you? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Gittleson. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Chair votes in the affirmative. That's six nothing vote. Uh, Superintendent's <clears throat> update. Okay. A few 
brief updates for you tonight. Um, on uh, September 28th, um, the LGBTQIA plus Rainbow Task Force um, and our student Rainbow Commissions at each of the school held uh, back to school gatherings and uh, back to school gathering on the front lawn of AHS. There are a few pictures here of the gathering and they had a lot of fun spending time with their peers uh, and some of their mentors and teachers came as well. It was a beautiful day and it's great to see that that's becoming a tradition in the Arlington Public Schools for us to hold these when the weather's nice in the fall and in the spring come together in community um, and affinity. And we, uh, I also just got back, I'm still a little bit jet lagged, um, from a very quick trip to our sister city in Nagao, Tokyo, Japan, uh, where we visited with um, the mayor there as well as the fire chief there. Um, I visited in, with the 40th anniversary town delegation. These delegations go about every five years. They sent a delegation um, to us, which included a member of their city council uh, and the mayor and other officials from Nagao, Kokyo. Uh, when we went, uh, I went with town manager Jim Feeney, fire chief Ch Kevin Kelly, uh, director of communications and family engagement for the school department, Wesley Pierre, and uh, Chair Paul Schlickman joined us as well. We visited three schools, the City Hall, the fire station, a few uh, sites that are right around Nagaokokyo, including a temple in the city. Um, and we had a lot of conversations about planning for future sustainability of student programming and cultural exchange, ways to improve the program and the educational value of it for their students um, and ours here. I will say the highlight of my trip was spending time with this fantastic classroom full of third graders. They were so much fun. Um, one of them drew me a picture that I'm holding up and another one taught me a traditional Japanese dance and uh, it was a blast. It's also the first time I've ever spent two hours in a classroom being the only person who spoke my language. And that is a humbling experience, I must mm -hmm. say. Um, it was a wonderful experience. It's the furthest I've ever been away from home. Um, and it was, I was a little nervous about it, to be perfectly honest, but it was fantastic to learn so much about another culture and to see our sister city um, in real life uh, and to learn about all the ways we're similar and very different. Um, and so I look forward to future partnership and to figuring out a way to make sure that when they come visit us, that both our students and their students are learning a lot through that experience. It's very aligned with our deeper learning goals, um, and it's been a very positive experience for many of our students who have had the opportunity to go uh, on the trip, which is one of our lower cost trips because of the homestay component of it. So we will be looking for host families. Um, in the next couple of months, we're actually gonna start doing some recruitment for host families. Uh, and we would really like to tie being a host family with going on the trip. And so that's something we'll be talking a little bit more about as we start planning for the project. Um, Director uh, Pierre will, uh, her department will sort of be overseeing this partnership moving forward as a community partnership. Uh, and so we'll have more updates for you to come. But it was a great experience and one that I uh, take, you know, with a lot of gratitude because not a lot of communities have uh, partnerships like this and it's really special. Uh, May I? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, one of the things that we ended up with a conversation about with the uh, folks in Nagaokoko, particularly the school department there, is to maintain some sort of a consistency and to set a standard for the relationship for our students so that the expectations that they have for their students need to mirror the expectations we have for our students, the expectations they have for host families needs to mirror ours so that uh, I think that this is a time where we really needed to have a thoughtful discussion and make adjustments to the way we operate on our side of the uh, arrangement so that uh, we're, we're truly respectful to uh, the expectations that, that they're having for us. The other thing is, uh, we did have the fire chief along with us, uh, and we did tour the fire station. And somebody asked me, do you want to go for a ride on the ladder truck? I said, well, okay, sure. They didn't tell me that the ride on the ladder truck was to get into the bucket on the ladder truck and go <laughs> up like about 14 stories and look down and I'm watching the superintendent go up there and says, you know, I really want to do that. <laughs> and I did and it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, 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 really, they really put on 
a show for us. They make us feel welcomed. Uh, the red carpet was out all over the place, and it was a very intense few days over there. We were, we were out of the hotel at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. All right. Um, there, we will be taking a cohort of um, leaders and teachers, um, including Ms. Keys, comes with us to these uh, to the Deeper Learning Dozen convening in Farmington, Connecticut next week. Uh, we've been part of the Deeper Learning Dozen um, consortium for the past. This will be our fourth year, um, and they do two convenings in person per year now, and they also do one remotely. So this will be the first one of the year. Uh, it's relatively local, which is nice. It means we can drive down to it. I will be attending this one. Dr. Ford Walker will attend um, one in New York City in the spring. Uh, and then there will be, like I said, a virtual one in December. We're looking forward to learning about how Farmington has um, achieved some coherence and cohesion over, over a decade uh, of leadership in their system. And they've been working towards deeper learning goals uh, for a very long time. And so I'm looking forward to learning with them. 2024-25 uh, is a YRBS survey year. Our Middlesex colleagues are collaborating on the um, Youth Risk Behavior Survey once again. We do this survey with our 7th through 12th graders every two years or so, and it provides us with some comparative data when we do it in partnership with Middlesex League. Uh, it provides us with comparison data against the Middlesex League, which is valuable to have. Tells us a little bit about um, the behaviors of our students uh, and also some of the mental health risks that they may be experiencing and so that we can respond to those proactively and include the data from that survey in our planning. It's a pretty comprehensive survey process, uh, so we'll be messaging that to families and uh, including the opt-out process very soon. Um, I did want to share a little bit about strategic working groups this year. We'll have some uh, community-wide messaging going out before too long, inviting folks into some of these groups. Some of the groups have formed and will continue on from last year. Uh, others might be welcoming some new membership. We just need to sort of finalize the details for each of them. Uh, we have five working groups for this year. It's possible one of them will split out. I'll talk about that when I get there. Uh, the first group is really focused on instruction. Uh, on deeper learning and inclusive instruction. Um, each of these groups has a task assigned to it. It is going to be focused on, some, on getting something done um, in the district. The deeper learning group will be particularly focused on defining um, for a future, like for the redevelopment of a district DCAP, which we can do absent a working group. It's, um, it's a comprehensive document. We just want to make sure that it's a useful tool to teachers and that it's aligned with our focus on deeper learning and our vision for high quality instruction. And so uh, what a DCAP can also do is define um, sort of our theory and our approach to and our models for intervention um, and what we do sort of to sort of flexibly ensure that if a student needs extra support in an area that they can get that and that we can then, once they've gained independence in an area, uh, release them from the need for that uh, if necessary. So they will be sort of simultaneously thinking about Tier 1 instruction and what excellent Tier 1 instruction looks like. and. Uh, how we do intervention, what our models for that are, uh, how MTSS is integrated into that vision, um, and building out the framework for a revised uh, district curriculum accommodation plan. So that's the first group. Uh, the DEIBJ Community Task Force is going to get started soon. We already have the applications for that. That's going to be one of our task forces this year, similar to the LGBTQIA plus task force, uh, except that this one is overseen by our, by Dr. Thomas, um, our director for DEIBJ. Uh, and Mr. Spiegel will be joining for that because some of the goals that we have related to recruitment and retention are linked to representation and continuing to expand the diversity of our staffing pool, as we talked about tonight. Um, it's possible that that group might sort of become two subcommittees, one really sort of focused on community engagement work, one maybe more focused on representation, staffing, recruitment, and retention. Um, but for right now, they're going to do a little bit of planning together uh, and see what transpires and what they want to work on specifically and what the community members who are joining the group want to work on. Because if it's significantly different from recruitment and retention, then it might make sense to split that off. Um, we are developing the professional learning committee. This is um, also a contractual obligation. And so uh, we would like to make sure that we have professional learning committees established that are providing input into um, what we're doing each year. Uh, the bargaining agreement requires that they meet for like a certain number of months, but we'd like to meet all year round. And so we'll figure out what that looks like um, with AEA and 
uh, make sure that we're planning for professional learning for all of our stakeholders and staff uh, who need to make who need to learn with us. Um, one group is going to be uh, ensuring excellence and attendance. The name is still under construction, but we're not calling it chronic absenteeism. We talked about that tonight already. Um, and then the last one is uh, creating inclusive learning spaces group. This is the group that will be developing a technology and space plan. Um, they're going to take a look at the capital needs of the district. Um, they are going to take a look at what the inclusive spaces committee or working group from last year had defined as what a really strong learning space that promotes deeper learning and accessibility needs to have in it. Um, the technology it needs to have in it, the furniture it needs to have in it, the design it needs to have, and they're going to be building a plan for making sure that we have spaces like that uh, in our schools that are going to support the strategic plan and the kind of instruction we want to do in the strategic plan, including a cost out of what that would cost us. Um, they're also thinking about sustainability because one of the goals of the town and one of the goals of our strategic plan is to improve sustainability and, electri and expand electrification across the school system. Um, so they have a really big task and ask to build this plan. It was one of the things that's listed in the strategic plan. We got started on it last year. And we're actually um, getting some consultative support for this group to help write that thing. Um, and I think it could be a really valuable core budgeting document sort of paired with the strategic plan. Um, and this is really on the operational side of the strategic plan. And so we're going to start our work on that. We talked about it a lot last year, and we're excited to get it off the ground. Uh, all working groups are led or overseen by a cabinet member. All of them, like I said, have a sort of specific thing they're working on for the year that is deeply tied to our strategic priorities. I tried to note which priorities for each one. Um, and then we'll, like I said, be communicating uh, broadly about these soon. We were trying to do a lot more sort of really focused work with the working groups this year. Last year was useful insofar as it taught a lot of community members about the work we're doing. It taught a lot of community members about the strategic plan and involved them in learning about sort of why we're doing what we're doing um, and engaged them in idea generation around what some of the next steps could be. We really want this year to be about deep implementation. We're entering year two. We need to get the stuff done. So uh, that's what these groups are heavily focused on. Uh, we do have a few administrative hiring searches open right now. Uh, as Mr. Spiegel mentioned, interim assistant principal at the high school uh, because Mr. McCarthy is taking a contractual, uh, it's a condition of the AAA agreement is uh, that they are allowed a contractual sabbatical approved by the superintendent. He'll be studying approaches to deeper learning and project-based learning throughout the U.S. Um, with his family. We also have uh, for one semester of this year, so he'll be on leave in January. Um, we also have a vacancy at OMS for interim assistant principal, and that is posted. Uh, tell your friends who would like to be an assistant principal because we are doing an open search for that particular role uh, as well as for the assistant principal of high school. We are in the final stages of identifying a director of finance. We had final interviews this week, um, and we're hoping to have an announcement. We have done this search once, and it did not successfully end with a candidate, so we're really hoping it will this time. Um, because we really need to fill that position in the district. And finally, your enrollments are in your materials, and I am happy to take any questions from the committee. Questions from the committee? Let me just hit the chair's prerogative on something that was sort of mentioned earlier, because we did approve the MOA for the CAF workers, uh, which was the purpose was to increase the salary so we could attract more folks. Uh, how are we doing in that regard? We have hired some new CAF workers in the past couple of weeks. I can check with um, the director, Denise Boucher, to see what um, what vacancies. Those aren't all tracked in. I, mean, maybe some of them are. I need to check with her to see where she is. And um, But we are serving food in every school every day, and kids are getting lunches. They're, they're they're, they've mm -hmm. been challenged this yeah. year by staffing. Yeah, I understand that. If we need to publicize more <laughs> yeah. for that, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to open that up here just to make sure everybody knows that what we did, why we did it. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in a nice, happy job um, uh, serving food to kids and finding joy in the cafeteria, uh, that's a good way to do it. Consent agenda. <clears throat> All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine. 
It will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant 25078, uh, October 8th, 2024, in the amount of $1,004,205.02, and school committee minutes for the meeting of September 26th, 2024 motion to approve the consent agenda by so Ms. ah oh, sorry. oh yeah no I'm, I'm happy Ms. Gittleson it wasn't who I expected <laughs> uh, second by Mr. Thielman um, roll call uh, Mr. Cardin yes Dr. Allison Ampey yes Mr. Thielman yes Ms. Gittleson yes Ms. Morgan yes chair votes the affirmative six nothing um, thank you. Uh, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Hi. So budget met this afternoon. Um, we discussed FY24. Uh, we learned that they're going to outsource the end of year report to ag capacity mm -hmm. given everything that's going on with um, having a new financial director. Um, for FY25, Mr. Gorski is working on a new approach to the periodic reporting, and we'll, we may see that on our next report, or the first report of the year, um, or maybe the second, we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, for FY26, you heard what we talked about, uh, and then we also discussed rental fees, and Mr. Gorski is working on aligning costs incurred with fees. Um, and we'll have a proposal for discussion at our next budget subcommittee meeting, which will be on the 13th of November. Thank you. Community relations. Ms. Exton is not with us at this point. Is there anybody else on the committee who has a report? Seeing none, CIAA, Ms. Morgan. We will have a report for our next meeting. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I just think since we're on the CIA, I, I, at that meeting, or will there be a discussion of the whole math conversation that came before us tonight? So I think the intention for the November meeting right now is to talk about uh, history um, as well as secondary level class sizes um, related to, well, yeah, around secondary level class sizes and then uh, middle school math pathways, but probably more general, like mm -hmm. not necessarily what we what we heard in public comment tonight, but more. So yeah, so we, we can provide an update on, on what that's going to look like at that November meeting when we're back in two weeks. Sounds good. Thank you. <clears throat> Facilities, Mr. Thielman. The superintendent and I talked this morning about scheduling a meeting, and that's all that I can report. <laughs> I hope it was a pleasant conversation. It was a good conversation. Great we conversation. just didn't get anywhere in terms of a date. Yeah. Yeah. We agreed we should meet. We agreed we should meet. <laughs> I'm glad you're so agreeable. Mm -hmm. uh, policies and procedures, Mr. Carden. Also still scheduling. Okay. That's a better way to frame it. <laughs> <laughs> More precise. More official. It does. But yours is more fun. Uh, and so I'll call you back up again, our Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We are moving along. Uh, I think everyone knows the phase uh, three should be done in February. Um, the committee is having a is meeting in November and December to look at um, sp items we haven't spent yet in the, in the budget uh, in different areas in the facility, like, uh, you know, audiovisual and furniture and stuff like that. And then... Um, we're also looking to see what we what might be added back, and the district leadership is and the high school leadership are making some recommendations to the committee to consider in a uh, draft form in November, and then in more likely final votes in December. Okay, excellent. So uh, we can anticipate a happy moving party over February vacation. That's the plan right now. There's no change in that. And, oh, excellent. It's it's fun watching the work come. You can see the bricks starting to come up on the. Yes, it is. Last, last building. Any liaison reports? Any announcements? Any future agenda items? 
There will be no executive session tonight, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. But before we adjourn, I have a little Nago to go gift for my colleagues on this committee. So make sure you have it before you leave. Um, on a motion to adjourn by Mr. Thielman, seconded by <coughs> Dr. Allison Ampey. Uh, roll call vote, Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Gittleson. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And the chair votes in the affirmative. We are adjourned at 9.08 p.m. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.